Good morning. I'd like to call the uh, Board of Selectmen Capital Budget Meeting for Tuesday, November 15, 2022, to order. Um, it's being conducted in a uh, uh, hybrid fashion, Zoom and in person, as is allowed by uh, legislative action. Charles, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Before we... I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, John. Okay, um, I want to welcome uh, our uh, compatriots from the Board of Finance, uh, Megan Scanlon and Jack. Is Jack participating this morning? Yeah, sorry, he's no, in and no, out no, participation. No, no. And uh, also uh, uh, Bob Hartman, uh, who I think has vacated his chair for a moment, and uh, Jeff Beatty is with us. I see. And also, um, Mike, yeah. so thank you for joining us. Uh, it's uh, always a good opportunity to get uh, the information early in the process. And um, please feel free, this will be uh, uh, open Q&A uh, after each department makes their, uh, their presentation. So um, with that, uh, my list says Park and Recreation is up first. Good morning. Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Tony's with me. Good morning, Tony. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to first start off by saying I appreciate, we appreciate the support of the Board of Select Board Finance have given us over the years because it's allowed us to we get compliments about our fields frequently. You know, and there was a little league uh girl softball tournament a couple of weeks ago, and it was right around Halloween. I actually had a trunk or treat as part of it, as part of the tournament. I have to stop up there and see that, but um, the the lo our local organization just talks about how these other towns that they come in and just say they love coming to Guilford because our fields are so good. That's because of what Tony the guys do, but we can't do what we do if we don't get the support that we get. And we just really appreciate that. Um, but it's also allowed us to make improvements to the community center and the roof, and, you know, upgrade HVAC over the years and. Um, the equipment that Tony and the guys need to get the job done. So we, we appreciate that the support that we've gotten. Um, so I'm going to highlight, if you want, at least initially, the, the uh, next year's uh, things for the, for the capital plan. I, I was breaking down by uh, parks and fields, community center, and equipment. So if it's okay if I do it like that, is that all right? Sure. Um, so um, in parks and fields, we have $30,000 we put in there for installing sand and slit drains at the Bittner soccer field. We found that's worked out well at the uh, Long Hill Park. Uh, we did that on the left field of the baseball field a number of years ago. Uh, the sod field at the high school, we did a similar project because it wasn't draining well. <clears throat> Bittner soccer field, is it's a premier, premier field, but the southwest, southwest corner of it, the, the wooded side of it, um, stays wet th this time of year as well. This time of year, they're done, but in the fall. <laughs> doesn't dry out very well. And um, uh, Tony can tell you there are times we, we try to cut the sod in November or early December, put new sod down for the goal areas. And the ground's frozen on that end. It just doesn't dry out. It's in the shade all the time. Um, so we had put in 30000 for putting the sand slit drains in there. Um, again, because we've had success in other fields with that. Um, the 120000 uh, for expanding pickleball courts, and I, I <laughs> A little diagram here for you to give you an idea of what it may look like. Um, this was uh, by the American Ramp Company, uh, which is a company we purchased the uh, skate park ramps from. They, they created this, but this was initially when we had talked about putting two basketball courts up there. If the courts at the emergency services are going to get closed, we were trying to be proactive. And, um, so, in this this rendering here. The far basketball court, the existing basketball court, we're going to convert that to uh, three uh, permanent pickleball courts. And then the, the other basketball court that's in there, that, that's, we're basically moving the basketball court right. toward the skate park. Skate park has shifted 90 degrees. Because right. right now it goes north-south, it'll go east-west. Um, and again, I spoke with the, uh, the company we purchased the ramps from uh, 18 years ago. Uh, when we were talking about this and said, will this impact the skateboarders if we turn it? And they, the distance between ramps, 
<clears throat> excuse me, is the same. Nothing's changed. I, I think it's six feet different or something. So it's really minor. It wouldn't, wouldn't have impact them at all. Um, and actually, when I thought about it, when we first bought the skate ramps, this is the direction they went that anyway. Designed. When we first did it, that's how it was. And for some reason, we changed it uh, over the years. So anyway, it, it would work out. Um, the 120,000 would be also include uh, the area that's just off this, the concrete slab that's all stone right now. It's about 10 feet on each side. This would include expanding, adding concrete there because that can give us three pickleball courts. If we don't do that, we can get two courts. It, it would be right on the edge, you know, so the playing surface would be right on the edge of that stone. There's no runoff area. And so um, we got a quote from uh, Hinding just to get an idea of what it would cost to expand that and to, um, you know, take the paint off the, uh, the existing basketball court, reline it for pickleball, put in the permanent um, uh, that post and that's, yeah. um, so it's about 120,000. And uh, <laughs> you, you know, pickleball people are very, um, they're very dedicated to this work. Um, I think the last four months, uh, every month they come to the Parks and Rec Commission meeting asking for us to expand up there. And we've had uh, one individual uh, request a similar expansion. With, with these courts, <laughs> how many courts total in scope are going to have? Okay, so that would give us seven permanent courts there. And then uh, when we redo the Adams ten tennis courts, well, even now, it's four uh, temporary courts. They have to bring their own net, or, or we provide a net, and they have to. It's not permanent because you have to have tennis still. Uh, and then at uh, Guilford Lakes, <clears throat> excuse me, there are two on that tennis court. So so seven, seven or four and two. So uh, so that'd be like 13, right? Per, yeah. But but seven permanent ones. The rest, you know, the, the rest are um, you know, you tennis, tennis court on a basketball court. Right. The best. Right. It's the fastest growing sport in the country. It is well, yeah, it's, it's fast as it goes up, it's going to come down. You know, it just you, know, you don't mind making some investment, but it's probably a ten or fifteen year cycle. Maybe, but for it's fifteen years, going to last forever. Yeah, yeah but the, the next generation of folks who can no longer play tennis. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's ama it's amazing. I think you're going to say LeBron James actually bought a uh, he created a league, it's a professional t uh, pickleball league. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, Same thing true. with what Cornell was. Yeah. Everything's got its cycles. Cycles, that's right. Uh, but Rick, popular. Rick um, relocating the skate park is not something that's going to be detrimental to the equipment itself. We've done that in the past, yes. as I recall, when we yeah. had skate when we uh, used to freeze uh, and make a skating pond yeah. up there, right? Just take it off every yeah. year. Yeah. All right. Now, secondly, one thing I think we had a discussion about whether or not this fits in the capital budget or not, but we had already made an allocation of about $350,000 to add basketball courts and improve the uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Overall, so uh, are we going to hear anything from the basketball people? Well, there's still going to be a course. <laughs> there still will be one. Right. We're just going to shift it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So on that diagram, the one next to the skate park, this was this will be right now. It's just open space. Right. Um, that so will be a basketball. Not this start in with one of their promotions. <laughs> Well, they, they, it would be somewhat disingenuous of them because they said uh, we said take our kids, drop them up at right. Bittner, uh, and even the, even the adults. <laughs> Until we made it nice enough that they wanted to go there. Yeah. And and we are, um, in effect, um, refurbishing that Adams court. Yes, we are. So, which was there, but really wasn't so used, used that much. Right. So. And I'll just, not to belabor this, but i throw this out the last... Thursday, I was invited to speak to um, a, a group of a class of sixth graders at Ball for Judy Milano's <laughs> class. And it was about the skate park. They want to know, you know how we built it and what our plans are. And they all had their little, little models they made out of cardboard of <laughs> skate parks. Cool. And uh, they, they've all been there. Because I asked how many, and every one of them has been there skateboarding. Um, and I told them how, you know, talk about changing the, the, the design of it a little bit. Um, and then I showed them, you know, we have our five year plan. I think four years out, replacing the skate park component with uh, new ramps and things. And I showed them that too, and they were like, wow, <laughs> they like it. <laughs> so, but we made it clear we're not eliminating skateboarding. Yeah, it's been here first, it's been here for a long time, and it's the people still use it. We're just shifting it uh, back to where it originally was. So, it shouldn't be any major impact there. Um, and then um, we, we also, for Bidner Park and next year's plan, we, we put in $250,000 for a uh, we call Bittner Park North Restroom, where the portalette is there now at the bottom of, at the end of the parking lot, at the base of the hill. So the commission and I were talking about this 
year round, that part of the park gets more use than the rest of the park. Obviously, spring and fall is busy with soccer and little league, and you know, people using the playground. But and we just renovated that bathroom. It's a you know, you don't brag about the bathroom. It's a nice bathroom facility, you know. And then, uh, but at the other end, we have all we have two hundred fifty seniors playing pickleball. We got the disc golf and hikers and skateboarders and basketball. You know, it's a portage on. And so, um, and we've actually had to start having that portage on clean twice a week. It just doesn't be able to keep up with the, the use up there. So we got to thinking, yeah, we really need to serve that population with something better than the portage on. Um, as you know, Matt, we, we were looking into the Clevis Multrum um, composting uh, unit, but. When we found out, uh, we talked to DEP and I uh, talked to the management at um, him and asked it, and they said that they're getting rid of them all and going with septic systems in, in all the state parks because it's it's it, cleaning is a mess. It's a mess. It's a challenge maintaining. Yeah, it's, like it's labor intensive. And labor intensive. You can't get pumped out. You have to shovel it, and, uh, and the buried on site. Um, so when we started thinking that, and when I heard that they're when I'm getting, I, I thought it was a great idea, something I've been looking into for 20 years, but when I heard that all oh, the state parks, they want to eliminate them and go with the septic, they said, all right, then maybe we shouldn't go in that direction. So uh, um, that 250,000 includes, uh, you know, well, we have to get a well up there, uh, septic system, um, and bring up electricity to it. Although uh, I spoke with Mike Ott um, up there, an uh, engineer, we were looking at, can, can we put solar panels on it? Will we need electricity brought to it? that as an option so it's more sustainable if we could do that so how, how, how firm is that number or is that just a place um it's pretty good i mean they talked with a contractor he felt that was a, a, a pretty reasonable number he wasn't sure exactly what the well cost might be but um now will that unit or that be as big as the other one or it's just uh one? smaller a little smaller yeah because yeah but kind of based on the the uh, jacob's beach but not having the, the, the large guard room there, maybe a small um, um, storage room for supplies. Yeah. Um, but like Jacobs, there's uh, two toilets in the ladies' room, a toilet in the urinal, and the men's room. So at Binner, it's uh, what, three three urinals and three a toilet? Urinals, one toilet for the men, yeah. and three toilets. Yeah. yeah. So we're thinking a little smaller than that, more like Jacobs. And it'll all be a total septic system. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and, and of course, we'd have to have a well, just a little, little water in there. Um, that, that's it. Any questions on that before I, we go to the um, yeah, community I do center? Rent, if I could, what's, what does it cost to rent a port of light or to buy a port of light? <laughs> it's a lot less. It's uh, right now, I mean, the price has been going up. It's about um, it's about 90 or, 90 or 100 pounds a month. Um, definitely less, no question about it, but I just feel like we had to do something better. Does there. that include the pumping out and everything, or that's the that top? pumping? Oh, yeah. 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 All right, let's move on. Okay, There's so. There's no such thing as a permanent building that gets pumped every week or every month or whatever. I mean, yeah, there's no, there's nothing between porta potty and permanent. I'll just ask that. Something better than a porta potty, but not quite as elaborate as this. Yeah. Um, no, where's a tank, a septic tank that, you know, gets pumped. You know, a bigger tank so that it does not be done twice a week type thing. I, I don't know if that's. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only other thing I've seen is like those trailers. Trailers, yeah. Right. Yeah, but that's still a four part. And I'm, I'm talking about a building, but, you know, a, a tank that get, has to be pumped through. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if there is some. Those trailers between. can be very nice, though. Yeah, some of the trailers. Yeah, but it's yeah. still a. But you gotta walk still a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have to make it accessible. Yeah, that's what it's challenge. Um, yeah. So, how long does a I think I'll take a pickup walk take to play? Eight hours. Two hours. Depends. If you shut somebody out, it's over pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, typically, you know, people play several sets. Uh, so, I think the way they, uh, the, uh, the reservations up there, it's a power at a time, um, is, is what they're, you know, when it's busy, people can stay on for an hour and then they have to relinquish the court. Somebody's right. waiting for them. So, all right. But, but the program, you know, we have our structured program this year, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, uh, morning uh, from 9 to noon. And then with Wednesday evening, I believe it is, or early evening. Uh, and then this year, this um, fall, we had a league on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is the first time we ever did a league, and that was very popular. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, 
It's crazy how how uh, yeah it's, it's it, had, it has become very popular. I can't tell you the number of uh, mm -hmm. folks my age uh, now uh, are, are are playing the game and are starting to play it and love it. I actually participated in one of the um, uh, the classes that yeah. the Park and Rec ran, and there were four courts out there, uh, and there was always for the class there was always at least uh, four to six people sitting on the sidelines waiting to get mm -hmm. rotated in yeah. and out. And those mm -hmm. and those classes were absolutely terrific. Yeah. yeah. So. How's the pickleball? Pickleball, not pickleball. Uh, disc golf doing? Still, it's it's busy. You know, the pro course is most of it. They'll utilize this too, right? It's um yeah. In, in fact, uh, I should mention the Coast Guard came and they they uh, put in almost all the tee pads for us. You know, most of the work there was volunteers. Other than what our guys have done for clearing. But the usage is up. Still, it's still still very popular. Yeah. And when the pro level is done, you know the. the the better players who can really throw it, they're they're salivating over it. I, I'll just give an example. Uh, fairway number twelve is like 140 feet now. The new one's 900 feet. <laughs> what? It's it's massive. What the golf course hole? Yeah, 300 yards. That's where Tony plays on that one. But <laughs> yeah, like 22 throws. <laughs> <Yeah>. I'm lucky. <laughs> I don't hit some trees. That's how I golf. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> South enjoying the weather. <laughs> Not too much actual golf. But it's still getting used. It right. does, yeah. Okay. Uh, the community center and some of the upgrades there. Uh, we put in 10,000 to replace <laughs> the south exterior siding. It, it's warping a little bit. Uh, we did the north side um, uh, last year, and uh, we did that in-house uh, between uh, one of our park guys and, and Todd. Uh, they got it done. So the, the cost of that is basically materials. Uh, you know, again, we'll do it in-house. Um, you know, it's just it's 30, almost 30 years old. And, um, you know, it's... Just it's warping. Uh, Forty thousand we put in for replacing the uh, counters and sinks. I think we'd asked for something uh, uh, last year, but it was it was didn't get into budget. But the counters and sinks again, they're they're almost they'll be thirty one years old by the time we uh, do this. Um, it's just upgrading them. Um, you know, it's a nice our facility's nice, but the bathrooms not as nice as it used to be. So, uh, you know, keep it keep everything looking good there for people that use that. Excuse me, Rick. What was the number? Of Items for that exciting. Ten thousand. Yeah. And um. Well, it's a line that's at the very bottom of page one. I forgot to bring that copy. Um. And then the rest of Park and Rec is page two. How firm are those numbers? And we're, we're talking about up and down. Uh, yeah, we did good. We got we got a I got a quote here from a, a Sloan company. Just to, so we had some real numbers. Yeah. yeah. This remember it is four bathrooms, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you broke a record having a whole page of park and rec. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah we had that conversation. That's what see, we've, we've been busy getting this ready for you. All right, let's let's move on because your peers are probably going to want to present. <laughs> All right. And we have a, a hard stop at noon time. All right, so, or at least I do. Mm -hmm. Forty thousand we have for replacing ceiling ceiling tiles in the Minnetonka and Quantico rooms. Uh, um, there's some old water damage from before we replaced the roof. And we can't get those kind of ceiling tiles anymore. Um, and the other problem is if if one, uh, is, you know, it's kind of a slanted uh, ceiling, and uh, if Todd is trying to replace one and, and it, like, say the one on the top, and it slips down, it's like a slide. It slides underneath all the way down to the bottom. And he's got to take other ones out to get it, get it up. And so with this would be a, like a grid system, like like here. So there'd be a grid, so it won't be able to slide down. He has to replace one. You don't have to worry about sliding right. down uh, in there. So that's for both uh, both rooms there. Um, if, um, there's, again, some old water damage. Uh, and then last thing for community center, we had $10,200 to re repair, not replace. I think we might have said replace, but repair sidewalks. But originally, we were looking at $75,000 to replace all the panels. But I walked in, and almost all of them are in great shape. Because what happens is they're sinking. And so there's a little bit of, I think, a trip point where the curb is, you know, we got seniors walking there and mm -hmm. there's maybe, a, in some cases, an inch where they've, they've sunken down. So there's a company that we found that <coughs> basically pump them up. Um, I've had that done. It's remarkable how it works. It does work. Works, works well. Yeah. So it's they a lot less. Foam underneath it or so. Yeah. yeah. A lot better than $75,000, 10200 so. And it's based on, we counted how many we need. And uh, we talked to uh, Atlas, a company that does this. And, uh, that they gave us that quote. All right. Now that this is on the public record, you're calling it a trip hazard. Yeah. Um, 
we should get it done now. Yep. So let's find some capital money. Take that off of this one. Let's let's find some I have, capital. I have facility money we can use. Yeah, okay. okay. You've identified it as a trip hazard, so that's good. All right. But I wasn't trying to be uh no, yeah, and it's know. just you know be careful about the words you use yeah. because liability comes okay. into play. It's a no community that makes us that we lose our municipal immunity. It's uh yeah, go ahead. I have funding for that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, equipment. Tony's going to take over here mostly. Uh, we've got quite a things, a few things we put in for, for equipment. Um, you you want to talk about some of these things, Tony? Sure. I mean, you know, the first item is the PTO chipper. We don't own a chipper currently. Public Works, you know, allows us or helps us out with uh, chipping quite often. Um, but we wanted to get something that we can personally use. I'm looking at a PTO that goes on the back of a loader that we already currently own. That's going to give us the ability to get into trails and into the disc golf course when needed. Um, our 20 foot trailer, as you can see, it's replacing a 2003 big Tex. It's one of two trim trailers that we use on a daily basis, you know, almost year round. Um, $12,000 for the 155 gallon Hardy boom sprayer. It's replacing an old 200 gallon 1995 sprayer that we have on a trailer. Uh, this one will also be PTO um, on a three point hitch on our loader. So I won't have to trailer it around. Um, it's also gonna be included in that price is a GPS tracker system that is like used on a farm like you. So, you know, you can track how you're spraying. So you're not over spraying, you're not, you know, using too much product. Uh, it's sometimes pretty difficult, the lighting and, you know, the grass to be able to tell. And then we have to buy extra product put in so that we can see it. So I think it's going to be a good upgrade for us. Um, and we are doing a lot more organic spraying and I, I foresee us doing even more <laughs> when we have a new unit. Um, walk behind seat or something we've needed for a few years and you know, take care of a lot of you know, the town buildings and um, we can't really use our, our bigger seaters on town buildings. So we've been renting it. Uh, it costs anywhere between four and $500, depending on where you go to rent it for one week. And we do it at least two or three times a year. Uh, we would use it much more if we had it in house. And I think, you know, in the long run, you know, it'll last us quite a long time and it'll pay for itself. Um, and then as far as on my end, you know, we are looking to a robotic field tanner. We've, uh, we've demoed one, we're demoing another one on Thursday. Uh, there's three different types that are on the market right now. One's local, you know, places like Yale have them. Um, one that we're demoing tomorrow, uh, Middletown, a couple places in Rhode Island have it. Um, so we do have references. And so this price is the top end of the ones that we've looked at. Um, there's different options. Um, so we priced out most of the options for, you know, holds more paint. Um, so just off the top of my head, you know, I just thought about this for your perspective. Um, it takes us two weeks to set fields up twice a year. So, you know, depending on season, beginning of spring, takes two of my guys two weeks, give or take. So it takes a lot of man hours, 160 uh, hours. Um, this machine can do a field that takes two of my guys four hours. It'll do it in 30 minutes with one guy. So just off setups alone, we'd save about 5,500 a year. Um, and that's just setting up our fields for the spring and setting up our fields for the fall. Um, and then there'd be some savings in paint. There'd be some savings. Just biggest thing for me, I don't have to have two guys paint every single week. I can have one, um, which is going to save me. I'm looking for manpower. That's my biggest. Okay, so it's, it's two weeks instead of up spring and fall or whatever. Correct. Okay. And then every week again, we repaint them every single week. Yeah, we do. That does obviously be doing it every week. It doesn't take two weeks. So you were talking, it, it takes said two weeks with all of you. Two weeks is that's because we have to set them up from scratch. We have to measure them, string them, paint them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So setting them up from scratch takes a while. And then once once, they're, once they're set up, the, the, say the spring field we do in the spring, we do 36 fields. So we have to set all 36 fields up. So soccer, football, lacrosse, field so hockey. Two weeks is for the 36 fields. It's just setting them all up. Then every week after that, it takes two days, two guys to repaint them. The robotic can do the uh, repainting as well. Can repaint, yep. Once you once you plug this all in, the, the, the first session of plugging them in takes the longest because you have to, you know, design it, make sure everything's set. Are they gas operated or battery? Powered? Battery powered. Our current painters are also battery powered, but we have to, you know, obviously we have to push them ourselves. 
But yeah, we kind of steered away. Interesting to see some of it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. They're coming Thursday to Cox School if anybody's interested in stuff. Right. Take a look. Yeah. What time? Uh, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. We're all farm equipment now. Yeah. 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 yeah, and some of these companies also do automated mowing, which we haven't really looked into. Um, but, you know, it's something that it's something that we're looking into. It's, it's a little expensive, but I think. Self driving lawnmowers. Oh, boy. I need something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Sitting here in the living room. Okay. A cigar or beer, <laughs> more look. watching a game. Or yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that's and then Rick, I think, can can touch on the uh passenger bus and the portable lights. Yeah, so we put in uh, 85,000 for a 20 passenger bus that would replace the 2009 bus. When we used to rent the uh, lease these from Greater New Haven Transit District, the standard was we had to replace them every five years or every 75,000 miles. So, this bus uh, will be 13 years old and it's got over 130,000 miles on it. And it's big to break down. I mean, it'll last like a car, it might get 200,000. You don't get that on one of these buses. Um, and, and Dave will tell you, it seems like we always have one of them in the shop or something, you know. Um, in fact, there's one we took totally out of service, just wasn't worth trying to fix it anymore. We just aren't using it. Um, I put the full eight, eight. How many buses do you, particularly do you want? Four, four. Yeah, because sometimes we have a trip with uh, two buses and we still need to. <laughs> Um, that's four buses plus the van, no we have yeah, a van. We have the van too. And the van we got because some of the driveways are hard to get into or didn't make sense to go to North Guilford or somewhere to pick up one or go to a VA hospital with a 20 passenger bus for one person. So that, that's where we have to get a passenger van too. And the, and the 85 is new? That's new, um, and that's uh, buying it outright. We we normally put in as for only eighteen thousand. We get a grant, grant, but it's, at some point they're gonna keep giving it to us. Um, you know, we we've gotten them. Uh, I think we have one right now in the in the mix. We're looking at. Um, we're waiting to, to order it. But once you order, it takes a year to get it anyway. Yeah. Um, so um, that's enough of the Terry Buck and I talked. We actually talked with somebody from. Uh, the company that we usually get them from, and that's that's about what they cost. Uh, Rick, would you just have uh, Terry uh, check with her uh, regular sources on the grant? Yeah, um, I've not heard that that funding was being eliminated. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last thing we had in there, we we, we put in uh, forty thousand dollars to purchase four portable lights. Um, the president of youth football came to the Parks and Recreation meeting uh, a couple months ago, asking if we would buy. Eight portable lights, so they don't have to rent them. They're rent, it's cost them almost ten thousand dollars now to rent those lights. Um, and, and they said, or permanent lights. And so we looked into permanent lights, and we met with the Musco company, and uh, to light up everything they need is about four hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't call, count bringing the electricity in from the from the road. I didn't even get never even got a price on that. But so then Tony and I were talking about it. We thought. And well, the commission too, and the field committee. Uh, who initially they 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 supported it, but then started when we walked the fields with the field committee. They're thinking, wow, four hundred thousand dollars, and it's really used six weeks out of the year, you know, for football practice. They don't need so much of the spring for soccer because, I mean, it stays light long. You know, it's mostly fall, and so, um, the the thinking of a four hundred thousand dollars is a lot to spend for a relatively short period of time. So what we thought is, well, let's buy four of the portable lights. They still have to rent for them, but they, they've been renting them for decades, right, for a long time, and, and it's half of what they have to pay, it's 5000 versus 10000 But then we, Tony and I were talking about if we ever wanted to bring them up to Bittner for pickleball, they're portable. We can put them anywhere we want. If uh, we need to supplement what the fire department gives us for the, uh, you know, for the fireworks for lighting up the road or, I don't know, Soccer Fest has their picnic at Jacobs Beach. It's going until 930. We can put light down there for them. Um, the portable portability, and we thought, and we figured four of them we could probably store somewhere. Eight we could, you know, we could we could handle four, um, and it's one tenth of the cost, forty thousand versus four hundred thousand. Um, and I talked to the president of youth football and let them know that just you know this is the direction we're looking at, um, that you know they would still have to pay something, um, but half of what they're paying now. So we thought it was reasonable, and the commission agreed with that. Um, I think that that's everything we have uh, for next year. I don't know if you have light, like you suggested, maybe bringing them up to uh, bid their pickleball and things like that. 
Who would operate them and turn them on? I mean, it isn't just a matter of throwing a switch, right? Aren't they motors that run generators? They, they are. I mean, our, our crew would put them up there. You know, we can leave it there. Uh, the fire department's great. Uh, when we had the evening league, they, you brought it, Mike, you guys brought it up and, and and they took it back that night, I think, right? Yeah, four times. And we just attack, left it attached to the pickup truck, set it up, and... Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, the fire department's 24-7, you know, would you be overtime at that situation? I think we just leave it there. If, it's, if we're going to use it, keep it up. But who would it operate? Well, we would have, well, we have uh, um, the instructor of the program, we could set we, we it. It is something that somebody could... Yeah, learn to it's turn not, that yeah, off. Not, yeah. it's and we fair. also have a, you know, we have a, I just remember seeing yeah. them extend and all that. You can just leave them extended and start the machine and shut yeah. off. Yeah, as long as they're set up, yeah, they it, have, it, you know, four points yeah. to raise it off and make okay, sure. So they it. actually turn it on and off is not. No, nah, it's, it's just mostly a switch and, a, you know, depends on which style you have. Yeah, yeah Sony started to say we, we have the park range there. We have them turn it off. <laughs> Fuel them? Are they you know, like propane tanks? So most of my diesel, right? diesel yeah. yeah. And they so can be. got to come around with a diesel truck. To <laughs> fuel well, we'll, we'll get, get the gas cans. We just uh, I don't know how many how many get. Mike, do you know how many gallons they hold? A lot. It takes <laughs> it's a it can go for a while before you have to recap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we would just. Well, it'd be important. We drive big gas station. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we can fill them here. A beautiful yeah. new diesel pump up at Public Works. Yeah. <laughs> gas and diesel. <laughs> Okay. Well, Rick, thank you very much. That's an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Uh, anyone from the Board of uh, Finance have any questions? I apologize for not even looking while we were going through that. Good? Good. All right. They just voted yes in support of the budget. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, MJ, who, who makes a decision as to whether some of these things could be or We do. We, uh, the Board does. I kind of move some things around based on okay. dollars, but um, certainly... That's, those are the discussions we'll have. And and how far out can we not? I mean, you've got one for using. If it, if it were to go through, replacing the Bittner Park Playscape in twenty twenty eight, but with ARPA funds, do we have any? No, that would be yeah, that would be too far. December twenty December thirty first, twenty twenty six. Right. We okay. would really probably only look at twenty four at this point to for ARPA money because okay, we have other. We do have a deadline on it. It's, yes, there is a deadline. <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Would the bus be? Could the bus be our <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> we could, it, 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 remember, the ARPA can now, with the, with the ten million dollar exemption, because we fall under that, we can use it for any general governmental purpose, mm -hmm. except for uh, paying down debt uh, and paying down um, uh, pension benefits. I would think you know. Being used to get people out and going again. Yeah. It's right. certainly, and, but again, I'm, I'm fairly confident that grant is not going away, um, and that would cover all the. Yeah, it's just a yeah. matter of whether we'd be chosen for it. Well, that's, that's a competition that's with other towns and cities. You know, so yeah, yeah okay, grant. I agree with Matt. So it's going to be there, but I think going to keep giving it to us. Right? We'd, we'd be very we'd benefit a lot. <laughs> Well, thank okay, you very much. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Rob, you're up. Sorry. Um, I just want to tell you Public Works was missed, so Public Works is after the library today. You got it. Morning, Rob. Good morning. So this will be a, a good bit more brief. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will just, after, after having heard these longer lists, I will say, um, you know, I'll commend Sandy while she's sitting here. The, the building that we moved into 14 years ago has held up remarkably well. Um, but, you know, there are some things looking five, 10 years out that I will be sort of starting to introduce down the road. But for the moment, um, we're in good shape. Um, the only addition um, in 2024, which was an adjustment, um, partly based on an increased quote uh, for the carpet replacement and an additional quote, uh, there was an incident outside of the hallway leading to the bathrooms, which was uh, not so good. So um, that's going to be accelerated in the recovery replacement. It was going to just be sort of plopped on to 2028, but now I'd like to move that up into the next year. Um, so it's 20,000 for the car. Sure, it's an tripping hazard. 
<laughs> Nothing like that. And then um, the computer hardware replacement is just um, what we set up at the, as soon as the capital budget was, was invented, um, we, we've always done that. Um, it costs about $60,000 to replace every single computer in the building. Um, so it's, it's a six year plan, but really it's four years for the public computers, five years for some staff. And then there's lots of like, you know, like say print release terminals, things like that that are more minimal, uh, the catalogs, things like that. Um, and I always note at these meetings, um, things when you see like things like 3D printing and VR goggles and things like that, that's not in this, that's the friends of a library or Guilford Library Association money. This is the computer that's checking you out at the circulation desk or my computer or the staff computers to reference there, things like that. Got it. Yeah. Any questions? No. Thank you for your simplicity. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Dave, hey, pull it up. Yep. Oh, it works. Oh, I'm sorry. Did anybody on, uh, from Board of Finance have any questions on that or comments? Come on up, Dave. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Thank you. Well, I did my budget, and this is my first one. Um, you know, Tom retired, and so I started to look at what we have and what we're looking forward to. Uh, some of the things that you see in there is. <laughs> I put in for an AC machine, which repair right now, what they're doing is they don't have the proper machine for the new refrigerant and the new cars. So that's why we put in for, for the new machines, uh, as well as a brake machine. Um, this tire challenger and balancer that they have right now, which they're trying to make it work, but really it's time for a replacement. Um, so that's why I put in for, for the monies for those. Um, you see something in there for crack sealing. Uh, we want to start crack sealing roads and start pulling away from chip seal. Uh, we have a lot of bikers and walkers. And so we want to start looking more towards making the roads last longer before going to a chip seal. So the crack seal the road, you're looking at seven to 10 years extended life of the road um, just by crack sealing them. I went and I had a vendor go through seven or eight roads uh, just to give us uh, an estimate and they're on state contract. They're the only contractor on state contract and to do all of those roads. We were looking at uh, $14,000. So, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I had them give me an estimate on autumn, autumn Ridge, Potter Hill road, Ridgeview circle, Cambridge way, Shaker court, Meadow Hills Drive, Sunset Ridge Drive, Garrison Drive, and Sconset Lane. And all of those roads came up to only $14,691 to crack seal. Wow. So for us to extend the life of the pavement before it gets to the point where we have to do a full regrade and everything, I think it's it's a home run for the town. We would save a lot of money. Um, talk to engineering when we go to reclaim roads. We can get away from reclaiming them down to the base maybe do a one inch mill on the road or a two inch mill on the road where you still have base. And when you do that, if you crack seal the cracks before you pave over them, they won't show through on the new pavement. But because what happens is if you mill a road and the cracks are there, they're gonna be there down the road. Uh, when we do lateral pipes in the road, we would crack seal all those. If you look at most of your roads, most of your cracks are wherever your joints are, wherever they, they did their passes. So if we crack seal those ahead of time, <laughs> we would beat that and we would uh, extend the longevity of our roads. So that's why I'm looking to get into the crack ceiling. All right, so we, our guys would do the crack ceiling. So if you're buying a machine or are we no, talking this about this is all, this is contract. This is contracted out. Okay. They come in, they they blow the, the cracks out. Yep. They they uh, use a lance to take care of any vegetation in the holes. Then they crack seal them and you can drive on the road once they're out of there. So the question is, is this, does this fit in the capital budget line item, or should we put it in the other? Uh, that's exactly where I'm headed. Yeah, so this is an ongoing, like, maintenance in, in lieu of chip sealing some areas. Yes. Right? So I think we'll put this in your operating budget. Um, maybe when we're doing operating, you can look at that line item. If we're not chip sealing as much, then maybe there's, you know, an adjustment there. Okay. Um, but this, this will go into your regular operating as a maintenance line. Okay, good. 
Right. Not, not that it won't be approved, but you know, just it's just in a different place. Okay. Yep. And then uh, you see I put in for uh, materials management, forty thousand dollars. So the stump dump where we have all of our material right now, and we sweep, clean basins, everything is there. And there was no plan in the past as to what to do with the material. It just can't sit there and it just keeps growing the piles. So my uh, goal would be to, to use the monies to have a contractor take the stuff. They would take it, recycle it, burn it, whatever they do, and they would use it however they, they see fit. But we need to bring down all of the, the materials we have there and uh, shrink the size of it. Right now there's, there's substantial piles over there. Um, so we want to use the monies and the goal is to, once we get this down to where the site is pretty cleaned up, we would just use a container, have a contractor use a container, the sweeper would dump in a container when it's full, they would just take the sweepings, done. Same thing with the uh, catch basin cleanings, go into a container and it would go. We have to test the material uh, and we're working on that right now uh, because we can't just call a contractor and say, come get it. They have to know what's in the material before they take it. So that's why I'm asking for the monies um, for the next five years for that. So um, if, that, if this goes through, do you have, would this help with the side problem of creating more parking space? Possibly. Is there a problem with parking there or something? At the stump now? Yeah. Um, not that I know of. Oh, okay. That was, I think, and then they redid the parking. Okay, because I thought I remember something about parking. It used to be a parking, parking issue when it was on before the bridge, now that they opened that up. Okay. I don't think there's a parking problem. Okay. That's pretty good. Did you mean a parking problem in the stump dump or adjacent to it? I have, have to be honest. Before the trail has been there, I thought I remember yeah. some no, discussion about that parking. A few years ago. Where the yeah, that, that's, the they redid that when they went after the bridge. The okay, so I, I just wondered if you were going to get a hidden benefit of more parking, but we don't need it. So, uh, but what what I appreciate with the day's attention to this issue is an overall management of that facility needs. We, we need to take a quick look, a, a longer look at it, and I think you and Janice have probably already had some conversations yes. around what to do with that. Uh, particularly since there are some wetlands up there. And there's, and, and, but this, in, in particular, these materials, which are pre predominantly from the street sweeping, right, uh, mm -hmm. potentially contain uh, things that uh, you know, we need to be very careful about. So uh, I appreciate it. But again, I mean, other than a container, how is that taxable? How is it? I'm trying to understand you know, management, uh, and I, I agree with that, but uh, I don't see it as capital, which is an operating budget thing. Well, it's a, this is a one-time you know, one thing to clean up and get rid of the materials that's or, that are already there that have built up over years. Right. Um, so this, uh, this, you know, again, we could we could put this capital, we could put an operating budget, uh, but let's let's give ourselves that. That's good. Yeah, I would say capital is you know, an asset. Right. If it's in for 40, same amount every year, you know, going out and down. Well, I don't think it would be. Yeah. My goal is once it's cleaned up, then that would just go to operating budget as just maintaining just the containers to get it out. But I didn't want to put forth a, a giant cost. Right. Small bites. We can certainly have those discussions when we're working through. Yeah. All right. And then uh, I put in there for. Uh, my usual various uh, drainage projects. So we have a problem now in public works where the guys are so happy that they're getting more work done than, than I can keep up with, which is great. But uh, so I put in for an increase of that. It used to be 25,000, I put in for 30,000 um, a year for the drainage projects. That's the buyer pipe and like all that kind of stuff. Um, they're actually doing a big job up the county road right now for working on that. Um, and then I put in for two, replacement of two pieces of equipment. One is the backhoe, which is a 99. Um, it's well overdue for replacement. So I believe I put in for that next year. Yeah. I have a quote from um, W.I. Clark on that, that source well, that price reflects in there. And that's before trading of the backhoe we have now. Yeah. And then the Bobcat skid steer, I wanted to replace that at the five-year album mark uh, with a new skid steer. Okay, great. 
So what a smoke machine is, that's what they use to test the vehicle for exhaust leaks. Right now they don't have anything for it, so. With the age, age of some of our vehicles that we're maintaining, that's, that's important. I think it was one of the trucks was a truck that one of the building department with, with the uh, exhaust coming into the car. Right, right now they send it out and they can do it in-house. That mean we're going to do emissions testing? I don't, uh, that would be is something totally different. We could probably check with the state and see if we could test our own emissions, but self-certified. We don't have that. Can I, bring, can I bring my truck? I'm having a problem. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to send out a $1,000 repair bill to, to get around it, get around emissions? <laughs> Any other questions? From uh, our uh, Board of Finance members? Any questions? Comments? Good? Everyone's good. Dave, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay, next up, fire and communications. Chief, good morning. So, uh, I'd like to start off again by thanking the Board of Select and Board of Finance uh, for all the support over the time. Yep. Um, for our budget this year for capital, um, for the most part, it's uh, everything that's been in there uh, for a little bit. The biggest items which we'll talk about are the replacement of the engine pumper. So that's going to replace a 1999 uh, in-service truck that's about 21, 22 years old. Um, that um, number continues to go up. It's uh, not good for the long term uh, for purchasing fire apparatus and that we've been warned by our vendors um, that uh, alone right there is that piece if we ordered it today is going to take about two to three years before it would arrive that's the scheduled delivery for large fire apparatus so um it's becoming more and more challenging for uh, large apparatus purchasing um the second piece that uh that's still in there is the uh, ambulance replacement that's going to be replacing a 2011 um, ambulance that's uh, the last for the full replacement that we're looking to replace, and then we'll get into uh, uh, restart the remount program from here forward. So that's the last chassis and box to get replaced. That's about, I believe it's 25 <laughs> to 30 years old, a box on that. Good. Um, well, the defibrillators, uh, EKG monitors, that's the five-year structure payment yep. for the new, uh, the new monitors we received last year. Yep. The... Uh, we have technical rescue, uh, that and the hazardous materials equipment. That plan is instead of, uh, again, I'll just talk about it again, it's important. Instead of replacing, you know, all of our rope equipment or all of our pieces of equipment in one year, we're That's spreading it out. So that way we have a rolling stock and uh, not everything expires at the same time. So we just broke that out over time. Great. Um, the thermal imaging cameras, uh, that was, we had in uh, three years, this will be the second year uh, to replace three of our thermal imaging cameras, the same thing, not doing everything each year and spreading it out over time. So um, it doesn't all expire. It's not all the same vintage era. Of those. Just quickly, Mike, what's the life cycle on those cameras? The, the general life cycle is about um, eight to 10 years. The biggest thing is electronics and technology. It's better than our cell phones. You know, it doesn't expire in two to four years. But uh, again, a critical piece in the fire service um, for especially in a smoke-filled environment and the ability to get in there and search for loss or trap victims. Yeah, so, the, so this three-year investment that we're in the middle of is one that will last for another six or seven years and we'll start the cycle again. Correct. Right? Right. Gotcha. Yeah, and then instead of doing it all in one shot, yeah. spreading yeah. it out to rotate. Mike, is there a grant offset for that? So, so that that's not a grant. That's not a grant. But um, but as we always do, if we have the opportunity to um, continue to seek grant funding, anything in our capital list that we can get grant funding for, we're always trying. Like air packs is a good example that, you know, we continue to apply every year for any grant we can to help offset all of these projects. Yeah, I had it noted as a grant offset, but I'll change that. Okay. Uh, and then the, uh, I think the last one, I think the gen the generators, uh, that's funded last year, right? Yeah, generators yeah, funded. Generators, generators funded. funded. So that's still on the list. Okay. Um, and then the last part of the ARPA money, right? 
Um, yes. yes. Sure. Okay. And then the last one was a civil preparedness sandbag machine. We brought that up last year, especially after the uh, you know, several large storms and uh, the continuance of uh, people uh, looking to get sandbags from public works and fire. Uh, the ability to not have uh, people load their own sand and load it for them. That was, uh, we talked about that last year as well. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, and as you can see, it's just, you know, the, 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 the pumper is going to go on a bond issue. Uh, this is the year we're going out, right? We have not gone. Co to correct. You'll, I think I, you'll see that at the very end of the printout I gave you, I have the two year bond funding noted. But again, that's another. You got Another that, meeting. So you got that updated number for the pumper? Yeah. Yeah, 920. Yeah. I talked about the. But we know that number may grow. So when we go to yeah. bond, we and even if we ordered it's two yeah. to three yeah. years away, no matter what. And, and, and Matt, fire trucks are out about two years. That's, that's, that's yeah. right. almost three now. So. All right. So let, let me be the wise guy. We, you and I did talk about uh, the capacity for uh, EVs or electric uh, uh, fire trucks. Was it Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin? Madison, Wisconsin, I think is the first one and right. one of the only ones right now. Yeah, yeah. And even the, you know, discussing that the cost of an EV generally right now is about 1.5 to 1.6 million versus the, just versus the nine uh, 940 or 920. And, and, and that's and a plain Jane. That's just right. the truck. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't include the charging system, which you're, is- You're probably talking two and a quarter just for the truck. When are they gonna make it easy for us to, uh, <laughs> to go green? It's, it's a start. I mean, obviously having uh, one frontline pumper in the country is uh, that's EV or you know hybrid. It's, and, it's, and the other issue is Florida's finding out right now with, with Electric cars is the salt water intrusion onto the lithium batteries are called ignition. So the fires and there's no easy way to put those out, right? Right. right. And we don't need a fire. Yeah, exactly. And you tend to go through salt water up here. So yeah. Any other questions? Not good. Not good. Questions here? No. Uh, any questions from the board of finance members? Okay, thank you. Community, you also communications? Yeah, communications. So the communications, uh, there's two, uh, I think two things on there for communications. The I'll start with the biggest uh, was the replacement of the, I'll say replacement, it's not replacement, maintenance, sustainment, and upgrade of the existing radio system. Um, that was in, but it's gone up. Uh, one of the big driving factors or pieces of that is the uh, end of service life on public works, park and rec, and the senior buses uh, radio system. So the band that they're in, uh, low band, uh, is currently some of this uh, is going to be rebanding or bringing them into the UHF spectrum. Um, the existing uh, last sustainment was done in 2008. Around 2010. 2010 bonding. was the last bonding for maintenance and sustainment. And we're at that point for end of service life for like microwave, the microwave links between the system and the backbone of the system. So a large part of this also covers the backbone of the uh, communication system that's used between police, fire, public works, park and rec, and uh, townwide. Yeah. Do you estimate that a project such as this would have a 10 year cycle? You're talking you talk, about the 25,000 or the 3 million? No, no, no. I'm talking about the 3, the, uh, three million. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Yeah. That's what I'm talking yep, about. Yep, just wanted to be sure. You yeah. got a 10 year cycle behind your thing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's and that will bring us up to the new the microwaves uh, sustainment. So those are the microwave pieces are what the towers all communicate with each other. Plus updated equipment, PD, FD, public. The big piece of that was public works and park and rec and senior buses coming up into the UHF spectrum to uh, because of the end of service life on their existing so radio. Replacing all the consoles. Yep, console uh, up, which is the main control point. But each one of those individual centers. things as they came up would come to this board before they were taken from the bond, right? You, you mean yes. uh, they would have to follow purchasing, purchasing policy. policy. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, so does this include, you said the consoles include the yep. 911 yep. center? Yeah, mm -hmm. and PD, entire and EOC, PD. EOC, okay. and everything. Yeah. Does the bond have to be that specific where it spells out each individual? Uh, Include, no, not not every component. Not to, yeah, right. it's it's no, the mean, project. It's the project name. It's okay. It, it can be. I just when you get talking about consoles. So no, we it, the bond never is that specific. Yeah. 
right? It would be all inclusive. Like when you buy a fire truck, we don't say hoses, tires. That's what I thought. Right. It's talking about yeah. specific equipment. It's the, the project itself. Right. So this this really covers the umbrella of all your communications so stuff. It's Town not one. just replacing the 911 console, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, again, Charlie, you and I have had these conversations. Okay. How many communities around the state are going through the process of replacing their 911 stuff? Uh, and again, home rule being what it is and having control of your 911 center is certainly one thing, but the county of Los Angeles has one uh, main 911 center, right? Uh, so uh, this is being replicated in municipalities all over the state. And I know that there will be some, uh, I've heard that there will be, uh, they'll come back at it again, like they always do, uh, in terms of uh, uh, peace act consolidation throughout the state. Uh, but uh, that is not real right now, so we need to replace this uh, as part of the system. But it, it's a, you know, for the future, that, that's a conversation that will continue to be had at the at the legislative side. So, and I know it impacts local home, local home and local control. But uh, at some point, um, it, it will probably be something we're going to. But maybe not in our careers. <laughs> anyway. Maybe your mics. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you Back in 2022. Any questions? Comments? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. you. Well done. Thanks. All right. <laughs> You all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Mike, uh, and Chief, before you leave, um, is, uh, is the Chief there as well? He's here. Okay. Um, one, one thing, I, I know we're, we're moving forward with um, the additional, the two additional bays, and that's making progress, right? Um, has uh, Is there any um, thought given to solar on your roofs or um, just is this something I had? Uh, I being being in the EOC, yeah. um, you know, the concern of having solar and coming off and damaging the roof and that kind of stuff. On the new one, we haven't discussed it. The addition is that the, the load in there is minimal, right. you know, just basically light bulbs. Okay. Yeah, it's not like the main building. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Because it's a, uh, there are, we, we're going to have some opportunities, I think, coming up to uh, do some additional solar. And I think the police department's uh, looking at a new roof, uh, which is the absolute mm -hmm. right time to start to look at solar. So um, I think when, when a new roof comes on, the top, that is something we should take a look at, maybe. Great. Yeah, we, we got to take a look at, you know, the phases of our emergency operations. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, speaking of uh, police department. I'm in your room. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So that uh, the uh, facial hair policy was enacted, huh? Just for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trouble today. <laughs> that was a nice cameo yesterday at the department head meeting. It came in behind the chief. <laughs> okay, what have you got for us? Well, I think that uh, a couple of things on our uh, on our list for this year's capital are reoccurring, as you know, every year, the, the, the vehicles and the upfits. Uh, we uh, rotate between two or three vehicles each year, on, at least on the mark side. And then for this this upcoming year, we're looking for uh, uh, two patrol vehicles and the upfits for those. Those would be the first two lines there. Okay. Those numbers reflect uh, what we've been told for uh, current pricing that we're going to see starting with 2023. Three around $8,200 a vehicle increase right now. And we're anticipating that with not only the vehicle, but any of the, uh, any of the equipment as well. So that's why those numbers are uh, uh, under, under uh, our building. Uh, we had, uh, we've left that $150 under the, under the replacement uh, that uh, uh, we know is not going to be anywhere near what it's going to be for the roof, but uh, 
as you know, with uh, the change from the, the storage building that we were going to use, we now have to look at uh, doing something with storage uh, on our building, which is going to be expanding into somewhere. Yep. So before we tear a roof off and start doing things like that, there's other engineering and things that we have to look at. So we're hoping that those costs there are going to help cover any engineering costs, things like that, that have to go into planning the roof and any expansions which as you see in the next year or two, it kind of pushes off of that vehicle port. I know we've talked about this with some other funding for uh, you know, when we do it before, and we left that as a placeholder only that, that, that in for the 24, 25. Uh, it's only a placeholder. Um, under equipment. Uh, excuse me, Chief. Uh, yep. I, I have it under 2024. 20, you have the port, the vehicle port under 2025? I do, I moved it out to 2025. Okay. Only again as a as a okay. Just want to be sure that my records. The roof, the roof, and the vehicle point. port are all going to be one project. Right now, they right. weren't before, but they both are. of those items in twenty twenty five. The roof, we're probably we're going to start the project here in twenty twenty three. But um, I think once we move forward and and get some idea of what it's going to cost and what kind of work needs to be done, uh, we've talked about expanding our women's locker room. We only have ten lockers in there now. We have nine officers that are female. Uh, and and some some other females who work in the building who don't have access to anything. Uh, so yeah, that's really tight. That locker room is really tight. Hopefully, we need to eventually walk yeah. me through it. Yeah, you know, twenty five years ago it was fine, but, but it, you know we're in a different time and place, and 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 we should be, and so it's it's time to do something like that. Um, under our, our uh, weapon systems, I'm going to let uh, Chris talk a little bit about uh, what we're thinking about with the uh, nine millimeter uh, Glock or conversion to a nine millimeter platform for our for our firearms. So um, typically every five years or so, we actually will go out and go and refresh our firearms. Typically, what that's been is purchasing new firearms, trading in our existing ones, and purchasing new ones because that's cheaper than actually doing the refurbishing package, which is typically around a few hundred dollars per firearm. And then we have to pay to have one of the officers, armorers do it um, and actually do the work on the firearm. So it takes some time there. Um, so we're at that point where these current uh, firearms that we're using are getting to that point where they have to be refurbished. So we've been looking at uh, transitioning from a 45 caliber to a nine millimeter, um, which is a more uh, user-friendly platform, less recoil, uh, higher uh, accuracy capabilities for all different users. Um, so in looking at that, um, we are basically, uh, we're, we're looking at also the ammo costs as well, switching from 45 caliber to nine millimeter. Over the next several years, we're looking at on an annual basis, saving about 30% a year on ammunition costs, which that's certainly gonna add up and offset a little bit of this upfront cost to transition to a new uh, weapons platform. So um, as part of our transition to nine millimeter, we're also looking at uh, improving our secondary uh, sighting option on the firearm. So right now we have iron sights and we also have a laser grip. So the laser grip on the firearms is something that not every officer can actually use because if you're a smaller statured officer, the grip is actually too large. So several of the officers actually have to use a different grip, which doesn't have that secondary sighting option, the backup sighting option. Um, so certainly from an officer safety standpoint, what we're looking at now is to transition to a red dot sight, which goes on top of the firearm. And that's actually, that would become the primary um, aiming sight. And then there would be backup iron sights on the pistols. And um, with that, it doesn't matter the uh, stature of the officer using the firearm, every platform would be the same. Um, and you'd have both that primary and secondary um, option for aiming, which is certainly going to improve uh, officer safety, like I said. And it's also going to actually give the officers a, a better capability in uh, what we refer to as shoot, don't shoot scenarios to make a better decision about the perceived threat that they're presented with and whether or not they need to make a decision to use lethal force or not. And the reason being for that is with a red dot, it's a lot easier for the user to keep both eyes open and be able to take a look at their entire world in front of them versus with an iron sight. If you've ever fired a, a pistol before, you have to actually stare down the sights and you actually have to blur out what is in the distance, whatever you're aiming at, and you have to focus your vision on the front sight, which 
again, it's, we're talking about fractions of a second, but ultimately with that red dot, you're keeping that, that world open to you and you're able to really focus on what's in front of you. So um, we certainly think based on our research that it's gonna be the best option moving forward to give that to all the officers so that they have the capability. It's, gonna, it's really gonna lower our liability um, and give the officers the best chance to be able to make the right decision in those scenarios. So um, I have a, a tentative cost breakdown um, with what we're looking at. So for the for the firearms themselves, we're looking at about twenty to twenty three thousand dollars to transition over. Um, the red dots ranging from anywhere from ten thousand to seventeen thousand uh, to equip each of the firearms with the red dot. Um, some of the packaging involved in that, the vendors can actually provide that at a discounted price if they're giving us both the firearm and the red dot at, at once. It's already pre-installed. Um, and then on the back end, you know, some of the things that we don't typically have to buy when we switch to firearm, but since we're switching a caliber and potentially the make of a firearm, we would actually need to look at holsters, which can range anywhere from about $8,700 to about $11,000. And then also uh, magazine pouches are about $2,500 to equip everybody. Um, and then we're working on details for a trade-in value. So all of our firearms, we'd be able to trade them in at a value ranging somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 to offset. Um, so right now we have a placeholder in there of $50,000, which we think is it's a good number. gonna, yeah, that's gonna cover what we need. Um, um, just to, in the backdrop of what's hell happened with the police accountability bill, et cetera, this to me would seem like an investment uh, in our staff uh, to give them uh, a better set, uh, better equip them to make the right decisions. Uh, and as you just mentioned, reduce the liability. So um, I see this is the complete opposite of some of the claims about defunding the police. But if we're giving, we're investing in our officers to give them the capacity to be more effective uh, police officers, I think it's something that. Okay. Is there additional training necessary for a change in firearms? Absolutely. Um, is that part of this 50000 So the, we're going to incorporate that as part of our operating budget for next year. We'll put that in for the training. What so. part number of that? So typically for firearms qualifications, we're looking at around $7,000 for that time frame for the Eight week. With, it's, it's We're training everybody in the department to go through firearms qualifications every year. Essentially, we're going to need to do at least that for transitioning the, the site that the officers are using. Include certification, basically. Yeah, so we're looking at a four to eight hour training that we would have to do for the officers, depending on where we end up uh, with whatever make we go with. If we so switch the, the number, is probably going to be closer to 60 for everything. It makes sense. Would Wouldn't certification but, have to be done every periodically for any? So every year we do firearms qualifications. Um, we do that every spring and then we have multiple times throughout the year that the officers are at the range. So the difference between a recertification and an existing firearm and a new one doesn't sound like it'd be a big difference. It's it's not it's not substantial now. We're gonna have essentially there's gonna be about a, at least a four hour training for transitioning to be able to utilize a red dot site versus a tip uh, traditional Isn't this Limitations with the dot? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, the maximum effective range of a handgun is, you know, we train to 25 yards. Yeah. It, it can be, once you start going beyond 25 yards with a handgun, uh, right. depending on, you know, how good a shooter you are, your accuracy start, starts to drop off. Rifles certainly much much red dot is would operate well within that range. Right? So oh yeah, seventy five feet. That's and, and, and and this is you know this is newer technology, not new that it's hasn't been tried. There's a lot of agencies that have transitioned to it. We've transitioned on a lot of our SWAT weapons already to the red dot. Uh, the team has, so it's it's not something that we're looking at. You know, cold. There is there's information, and okay. we've talked yeah. to other departments around very close to us that. Have, have done the transition. Yeah, I, I agree with Matt's assessment that you know, this is uh, this is an upgrade for <clears throat> both the public and yourselves. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next line I have in there is uh, patrol canine and equipment, and this is uh, uh, you know dogs have uh, they are only good for so long. Uh, so uh, you know Brittany and Kobe have been. Uh, 
I think it's almost uh, six years now together. Uh, he's uh, eight, eight years old. He is coming to his, his retirement his days. Years. Yes. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're anticipating, you know, probably by the end of the year is what we had been looking at, you know, talking to Brittany and, and, and through the training and stuff uh, that we we'll are probably see Kobe retiring by the end of the year. So with that in mind, um, you know, we, we think that the canine is a great resource and asset for the department. Uh, it's also a great public relations tool. You see them when we have national night out and things like that. Great, a great way to uh, interact with the community. Um, so we, we, you know, that number reflects uh, purchasing a dog, uh, all the equipment required for him or uh, for, for, for the dog um, to, to bring him to a point where then we would send the officer to training uh, if the officer got the, the canine. So that's what that number reflects. Is there a, a specific vehicle that's dedicated to a canine need? There are. So, so they're outfitted different. Yes. Yeah. They have special, they have, air, uh, they, they have an air conditioner or heater inside of it that keeps a constant temperature, uh, depending on the temperature outside. Uh, there are alarms that we've uh, uh, put together for the, the vehicle, so if that temperature goes above a certain number, the alarm goes off on the officer's How phone. How many canine vehicles do we have? So right now we have two outfitted. Um, we are actively looking to also outfit a spare vehicle as well, in case one of theirs needs to go to the shop. Um, it's not going to have all the same bells and whistles, though. It, it, essentially, what we'll do is when, when, when probably uh, with Brittany's car, uh, it's, it, it is an older car. It would rotate into that spare, which we would do with unknown patrol car anyway. Uh, we will rotate into a spare function, and then any new vehicle or new officer that came in uh, upgrade that car, um, a new car, another car. A canine vehicle could be used for regular. Also, it could so that that spare car could be used once one because the cars are take home cars for the two canine officers that they have because they have to, for, to transport the dogs. Um, but that spare car could then become available for anybody to use uh, if they needed it, um, uh, not just the canine officers. But we would leave the canine set up inside the car. All right. Um, that's pretty much it, right? I've got the server on the body arm. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the server is uh, just, uh, again, uh, end of life. Uh, we work with Jay, who you know is our uh, the IT director with public safety. He keeps us up to speed when things like that have to be changed or upgraded. That's a, that's a server that uh, that essentially takes all of our data yeah. and stores it. So yeah. uh, that's that's an upgrade for, for this year. And then the body armor uh, replacement, again, that's a reoccurring every five years. Those body, that body armor is replaced. Um, that number changes every year depending on who leaves and who comes and who we have to plug in. Uh, the number this year also reflects uh, two, uh, two, two, we'll call them kits, SWAT kits for replacements for SWAT officers. Uh, with that in mind, we are working to try and get a better number, uh, working regionally with the team to try and purchase all that they need through one vendor so that we don't have to put out one off at a higher price. So hopefully that number will be less than what we anticipated. Thanks. To go back to the canine one more second, yeah. I'm sorry. You said one dog is going to retire this year. How about the second one? Uh, he's only about four years old, so but we're hoping another four or five years out of him. <laughs> yeah. Depending on their health. Yeah. Right. Usually, you no, I just, you know, just, I just didn't know if it was next year. Yeah, yeah, that eight to 10 year range for the dog, you know, they start. We're like us. We get to a certain point. We <laughs> think we can do it, but we can't quite get getting done. a little close to home. Yeah. Right now. Right. Exactly. You're telling us something. <laughs> so I knew some of us could relate. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah. We're back to Mike. <laughs> right. Any questions? Any, questions? Right. Uh, any further questions? From our brethren at the, on the Board of Finance? None? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Thank you folks. Chairman, have a good day. Great day, folks. Okay, golf course. Ed. Good morning, Ted. How are you? Good morning. How's everybody? Everyone's great. I'm pretty good. I get to go. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, basically, I have two pieces of equipment um, looking to uh, replace in 24 and 25. Um, one of them is 22 years old. Um, it's a grounds master, and the other one is 25 years old. So basically, just upgrading uh, old equipment, and uh, that's what I have out um, presently out there. I just got it from uh, from the police department. The roof. I thought of it. Our roof is 20 years old at the golf course, and it's shingled. But I think we can get to about 30 years, so I don't think I need to put it in there yet. But I just happened to cross my mind just listening yeah. to the police department. Uh, I think about 30 years, about normal for a shingled roof, right? I didn't happen to think, you know, just bring it up. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for the alert. Some of us may or may not be uh, worried about the thing here in a second. No, it's a saying, recurring theme today see, for right. some reason. See, so we could just built the building. <laughs> right. so, it's 20 years old already. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's 20 years. Wow. So, but I think a normal shingle, you know, it's, it's the 25 to 30, 30, 30, 30 year shingles, I think are pretty good. Yeah. That's basically what I had for you. What, okay. what is the real master sidewinder? So one of them uh, cuts the uh, rough mower is, is, is a rough mower, and the other one, the sidewinder, is a uh, is a real mower. So it cuts either the greens or the or the tees of the fairways. Okay. Which is a real mower, which cuts down to a lower height of cut. Anything under an inch okay. uh, cut mowers with uh, the differentials here. Okay. Yeah. All right, and you just need the uh, uh, real master thirty one hundred this year, and then the next year would be the second one. Good. Correct. Excellent. Any questions? Thanks for the log. Yeah, that's that's another one. Um, I did talk to my Toro. I'm going to be coming to the board of selectmen. I think I, on Monday, uh, looking for another piece of equipment, um, which for is for which this is part this of the year. existing capital. This year's this year's this year's right. capital. Yeah. But I did talk to my Toro rep, and he says all day a year. Out, I know that's like the fire department's talking two or three years, but their Toro's out for a year, and he says, you know, and every year the prices seem to go up around two to twenty five hundred. Just to let you know, yeah. uh, just just the way it is. So I mean, my prices are up to date as of right now, but that's just the way it goes. It's the best you can do, yeah. right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Uh, board of Finance, good. I had one question, real quick. Sure, sure. Uh, not capital related. Has the warm weather kept kept the golfers out on the golf course? Oh yeah, yeah. We've had uh, we've had a, a, a great fall out there. I mean, except for this past weekend with the rainy weekend, uh, that right. kept it that kept them away. But Excellent. overall, everything's been very good this year. And, and, great. Uh, when, when are you closing the course? Uh, we actually have a greens meeting tonight, okay. uh, so we're that's in the agenda. Gotcha. So usually next Sunday after Thanksgiving. Oh, somewhat the date that we that we put in the, in the past. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, cool. All right. Natural resources. Good morning, Kevin. Morning. A couple of new things and one old old thing on the. Um, budget there. Um, the older one will be is the uh, a couple more years is the um, F-150 pickup um, battery charge uh, on the list right. for that one there. Okay. Uh, a lot of local driving, not too much long distance travel. So uh, trying to get that one into our sustainability. Uh, Thank you very much there. for that. Is that uh, hybrid or fully? Uh... The um, one I have looked right now is is the fully battery operated one, which is a, has a high price to it, but we'll see as it gets closer to time. Yeah. Um, and probably might be more markets of choices coming out in the future there. Right now it's just the Ford that I looked at, but I think I hear the other Does Chevys and stuff starting to come Chevy, out. Chevy had a commitment by 2035 to be all uh, electric, I think. Is that, so the other one's moving more, most aggressively. So we'll, like I said, we'll keep an eye on them. Now. Comparative between the two as we yep. get closer to that time period. It's right now it's a 2008 Ranger I've been running around with, and it's uh, doing. <laughs> it's, it starts in the morning. It, it starts in the morning. And the, I just have to actually one thing I have to do is it's starting to show a little rush. I have to have them, that public works cut off the um, um, little side steps there. They're starting to show a little uh, wear there. But besides that, it gets me where I want to go. Point A to point B. There you go. What what year is it? 
And we bought it used. It was sat on a lot for a couple. It bought on a, sat on a lot for a couple of years uh, before we purchased it. So it was like two or three years on a lot, I think it was. Um, but yes, yeah, I think I've I had it driving for about ten to eight years, uh, eight to ten years. I think I've had this one at least. Um, the next um, items, two items I have deal with Lake Quinnipiac. One is our um, regular. Um, treatment in the lake with herbicide treatment. Um, the price for that one's gone up. If you've um, noticed, just about uh, $67,000. Um, that's based on um, this past year. Um, we hired BSS group to do a, uh, a lake study, uh, provide recommendations on uh, proper care of the lake and proper management of the lake there. Uh, and one of the things that came out of it is that we're missing the um, that some of the treatments there, we're doing one shot treatments there, and the way some of the plants are that we're uh, trying to treat. Um, one plant, which is the curly pond weed, um, needs to be treated early on, basically April ish um, to May. Um, if, if we don't get that point in time, the seeds get spread and then it regenerates um, the following years. Um, so that one's moved into an earlier, earlier time period there. And then the other cost increases for the the time period we've been doing is a change of the chemical um, to sonar, which is a pelletized um, treatment there, uh, which has a longer effect. It gets down to the roots. Uh, it's supposed to have a longer acting period there. Um, this one is um, might be a challenge because we've um, asked uh, DEP before for this help um, for use of this one, and, and we've had issues. Uh, I've been rejected for using this one or their comments there, but um, we're trying um, in our permitting again to go after it. Now we'll have to you utilize the same components we've been using, which would still fall within, fall within the budget that's um, noted here. Um, we will, I will go after, try to go after the it's grant the again grant. for the state grant there. Um, it's been a, um, I think last time we did it was a 50, I went for 50% um, town and 50% um, state reimbursement Motion. there. Um, I'll have to look at the numbers again. Um, I don't want to overdo the price there and then Get rejected for it. So yeah. the What's when is the application window for that grant? I haven't seen it come out yet, um, but I need to watch out for it there. Yeah, just uh, you know, even though it'll be here before we know it. Uh, yeah. The final decision on this doesn't happen until March, so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're hopefully by March would have a better indication. Yeah. And sometimes they take a while. Once even once they say it's, you get it, and then the contract period almost we lose another three or four months. I remember last year, so we had, when we did get it, we almost lost a season. We actually do use, utilize it for the following. But this, the, the, this, this funding is for the 23, 24 years. 23, so 24. We have funding in place to do the spray, do the treatment uh, this coming spring, right? And we're going to move that up to, to meet the timeline you just talked about. Right. Yeah, I think we have current funding okay. in our existing budget there. Where are we using mats? Are we still using? We are still using the mats at the beach area there. Um, they working out, which right? works well. Um, I understand this year they didn't put them down, and they're now kicking themselves for not doing it because there was some um, regrowth there. Yeah. Um, but they put them down in May, uh, hold them down for four or five weeks there, and it actually prevents their their long term growth of it. Um, and they actually do make it pretty well through the season there. Every now and then they may have to go pull one or two or something like that, but uh, they seem to be holding up well, and it's a great. Alternative um, for short, small areas, uh, especially for the lake, lake owners to utilize. So you're not using the herbicides in large areas where you're not needed. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and then the uh, water testing. So the next one we're looking at for the lake there is a, um, uh, a consulting manager and, wa and um, water testing. Uh, so the manager be helping the commission. Uh, the subcommittee with oversight of the lake there and also conducting water sampling, um, potential uh, tracking of issues if we determine there's some um, contamination running down the stream area, they can help do some tracking to determine where it's coming from and what's affecting the lake there. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this is equipment we've made to uh, the homeowners uh, around, the, around the facility yeah. that we're going to do some kind of uh, overall uh, management. Somebody's responsible for advocating for that, that property. Um, should this be an operating expense? That's what I was looking Poss possibly. I wasn't sure where to, right? So I just right now just bring up the topic there. And like I said, it's listed yep. as a consultant. Um, so it could be correct. Yep. 
That's why I was see the direction here, here but it's <laughs> um, the responsibilities we kind of started um, writing out, and it's kind of in the uh, description there. Um, yeah. The responsibilities for the person there, which, as you indicated, is be a liaison um, with the town and also with the friends of the lake and other users, park and rec and other users of the lake there. Um, help with the permitting uh, as we go through it. Uh, unfortunately, this one won't be on until next season. Uh, so we'll be doing the permitting ourselves this year, but hopefully in the future, um, the consultant could help us with that. That's right. Um, yeah, you guys don't have the benefit of the backup, um, but uh, okay. we just talked a little bit about the consulting manager's responsibilities. Attend Guilford Conservation Commission subcommittee meetings as needed. Assist the Guilford Conservation Commission subcommittee with implementation of the aquatic vegetation management as outlined in the January 22 Lake Quantipug uh, management plan. This is a follow up on complaints regarding the lake. Maintains contact with the Guilford um, Parks and Recreation Department, friends like lake users. Prepare and submit Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Natural resources database review forms and aquatic pest, uh, pesticide permits. Request bids for treatment of uh, Lake Quantum Park in accordance with the management plan and then deep uh, with deep approvals. Schedule aquatic vegetation management treatment. Uh, provide required notifications to adjacent property owners. Conduct follow up inspections of Lake Quantum Park treatments. Conduct water quality monitoring uh, as outlined in the management uh, plan. Provide yearly report and make presentation to the Conservation Commission. And create yearly budget for Lake Quantum Park uh, management activities. So um, that's a, that, that's the scope of responsibilities for that uh, particular individual. And again, this is uh, you know one of our uh, natural resources here. Uh, and I believe this is the best one. So these have been reviewed by the um, or started at the subcommittee and reviewed by the um, conservation commission. Right. Do I remember that there was some question about ownership? What will the state place? Yeah. There, there's a big question there, um, and we're just calling it water is the state of Connecticut. We don't know who owns the lake bottom there, and be might understand be a big commitment to determine that with deep searches and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But as far as cooperation between the, the state and the town. They've kind of been somewhat hands off, should we say there? I mean, we, as part of putting this report together, um, the fisheries department was great. They provided us input for the um, management plan that we put together there. Um, but the natural resource group there, the NDDD group there, um, we reached out multiple times for them and they didn't provide any comments from that um, report that we put together there, which we're hoping their comments would help us in terms of our management and what we, they might see as appropriate for um, treatments on the lake there, and I guess they want to be a reactive group versus a proactive helping us with the um, reports there. They know how to move forward there. So to your point, so, uh, so at some point we probably should bite the bullet and uh, do a title, uh, extensive title search and run through that. Um, it'd be nice if we could do it before we have to pay for the dam, but uh, we're, hoping somebody, we're, hoping, we're hoping to use somebody else's money for the for the dam anyway. But. Well, that's always the issue. I mean, you know, everything's fine until you know, personnel change or whatever reason, all of a sudden it crops up. And, you, know, well, the, you, you know where. Yeah, the, this the, must the, happen in other towns with town and state lake use of the same lake. I mean, well, most of them are designated as state owned parks and properties. This one is not. Uh, is no. And, uh, but they do have a boat launch that they have. Right? Yeah. That, that's <laughs> their boat launch. Right? Yes, yeah, so they're both connected off of the state right well, away. Or a state lake. <laughs> And even, I mean, in the context of the capital budget, it wouldn't necessarily change who's paying for this. I mean, they might not feel that these things are necessary, Sorry. and we might still want to do it. Agreed. So. Agreed. Yeah, we, we do get about us. weed control with the brown and the bowl lunch when all of a sudden when they wake up to that issue. Yeah. yeah. And we do get a $3,000 <laughs> yearly donation from the you know, from show. Yeah, show, because they're, uh, yeah. they're sure. protein is right on the right. We do a lot of treatment, um, the northern treatments around there. Their area there. All right. Any other know, yeah, I know uh, the storage building is out there a ways, but it was gonna, has just, there been any thought or discussion about where? The uh, this is only just throughout. This is um, well, I heard a conversation with Dave there. I the spot I'm focusing in on is around the Sullivan Drive and East River Reserve area there. That's a uh, probably a heavy use of the equipment in that area there. 
have it right near the location. Well, the reason I brought that up is that I was thinking the same thing. And earlier, you know, Dave was talking about uh, cleaning up that area, yeah. whatever the word. I mean, there might be the time to have that communication, knowing that it's out there ways, but have that in his thinking out there so that some space starts being set aside, let's say, or whatever. Right, yeah, I mean, if they said if they started this year, seeing um, reactions here, or seeing somewhat positive, yeah. and then I'll place it follow up with Dave, because one thought right now I have is for like two small garage bays for my permit, but and maybe the, the thought I had there also was seeing if Dave needs a, a larger bay, potentially if they have the loader down there, they can keep that inside a um, secure facility that they're pushing around the piles and stuff there, so I'm not sure what and potentially for the attendant the there, having, a better, so, yeah. having yeah. a better location. You than might be more familiar with the property, or I don't know, maybe Janice is. When you go by the parking lot, you know, their storage area is on the left. Yep. But if the driveway goes straight, how far in does our property go that way? I mean, I know that's kind of just been overgrown at this point. Well, heading straight. Instead of you know, making the turn by the parking lot, you just keep going yeah. straight. Um, we have a little bit further, but I think you're starting in some wet, wet areas in there. Um, oh, really? uh, I would have thought it was upland. It looked like it was going up. It's kind of stream flow no. down. Okay, there, well, but, well, uh, well whatever we, my point was that, you know, I think... But having uh, the survey we talked about there would yeah. be... Coordinating with Dave yep. you know, it's like an opportune time for long-term planning. What about space in the, called the Thane building, or the, you know, the, the Bilco building that we bought near Public Works? Well, that's that's temporary. That's us. temporary, yeah. and it's pretty well been um, divvied up by divvied up there. But um, uh, like I said, I have the machine well, coming in, which will probably be stored all public works until that gets you talked about it for years down the pike, right. anyway. So, yeah, by then, um, it might be a whole different ballgame now. I mean, the like I said, the new facility you're talking about for public works is basically going to be way out of the way from my employees. They're going to be losing a lot of travel time for them to go get equipment and get to where they need to be. Agreed. I just wondered about, I guess, so that building down there where Public Works is now is already being used and built and everything. Yeah. yeah I mean, the wood shop and stuff on the lower level there, my guys actually have a couple lockers and stuff in there. They've been storing their equipment in there, so it's fairly um, well built out, I should say, in the lower levels there for storage and stuff. Whatever happened to the crane in there? Um, we sold that. The, the big crane, I think, is still in place, but I think they took down the oh, the crane in the lower section for the, yeah. the headroom and stuff like that. I thought we sold that. I would. I mean, that's facilities there. So those are my thank you, Kevin. My items. Any further. Anyone? No traffic issue. Bueller. Thank you. Oh, you know, you know, one other question. Uh, we talked about the other day with uh, public works in a bucket truck. Is that going to affect your tree situation? I know it's like well, I haven't heard much of Dave about his plan is it, but I think that truck would probably be utilized a lot for their summer maintenance and stuff that they're doing with cutting back the, the plow roots and the lower branches, uh, the higher the truck. truck. I mean, it's going to help with a lot of emergency, some emergency work and stuff like that, but I think they have their their program themselves for the maintenance of the roads and replacing the guy in the bucket, so payload bucket versus to... being in a safe well, lane. But like there's a, some a, mix a, we can work. Uh, yeah, and, and, and those conversations do need to take place yeah. um, because there can, there can be some support for your home yeah. tree uh, tree work as opposed to having to contract it out. And of course, we'll be talking about that in your operating budget because I have a suspicion you'll probably be asking for more money in your team. <laughs> And, and I'd be disappointed if you didn't. <laughs> yeah, this is as bad a year as ever with the drought. Yeah, yeah I mean, the oak trees, which usually hold the leaves on the longest, yeah. are dropping the longest. Yeah. Yeah. No acorns? No acorns. No acorns. Right. Which might be a good thing in the future. Right. <laughs> You're right. like <laughs> oaks. That's right. Um, just as, a, uh, as another point that I wanted to talk about. I met with uh, Kevin and Shalon Towers, who's the uh, current chair of the Tree Advisory Board, 
um, and they are uh, put together a recommendation for an ordinance to update the uh, our, our official tree uh, policy. policy. So uh, that will be coming before us uh, relatively soon. And it really talks about replacement. Uh, it's, it's largely focused yeah. on replacement. Replacement of trees, how to handle trees when they fall, which direction, prioritize, prioritizing removals. And ensuring replacement for everyone that gets taken out. Yeah, uh, definitely replacement's a big, big yeah. part of that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Go. Only come on down. Information systems. Got three items for this year, right? Yeah, so I'll start with the, um, the list of the wireless access points. Those are end of life. Uh, they all still work, but I have no support on them. Those were installed like 2016. And where are they located? So these are the all throughout all the town. Yes, yeah, so town hall, youth family, town hall south. Gotcha. Yeah, all, all those. So that cost is for all of them with the next level up that they will, um, the configuration will go to those and can't go any higher. They're all, they're downgradable with older devices. Okay. Um, Correct. That, that, yeah, that'll work. Um, the next one would be at this building, which is our wiring between all the network devices which got installed when I started. So was that when Christ Warren Nickers or what? 1998. So they <laughs> yes. Um what, what is the what is the current uh, generation of uh, network wiring? Well the wiring could go I actually I I printed that out. I don't know if I put it in there. Um what we would go to is Cat 6E, That's which is all we really need here, and that will boost the speed between all the devices. Right now, the the wire, what it really is, is the the twisted pair inside. It's the way they do it. Um, the question, I think the question was more about: Are we investing? Are we putting something in that is going to last? Going more? forward, yeah. Oh, that that as the, speed. the most current. Uh, yes. Okay. So right now, like between a computer, even though we have gigabyte network cards, we're only transferring data at 100 megabytes. And that's because of the wiring. Okay. This would up it to a gigabyte between firewall, computer server, the server, all that. And that's really only here. The other ones, the other buildings are newer. They got it's it's already the it's uh, I think it's five E, which is good enough. Good enough for them. Yeah. yeah. So and that's actually putting a a redundancy in here in order to switch it over. The other wiring is gonna still stay here, yeah. So you're not pulling it out. Okay. Hopefully. There's room. Well, that's good. Yeah. So okay. the replacement PCs or laptops is is the same that we've had there in there each year. Um, we're probably about at 75%. Most people have laptop uh, docking setups and about 25% are still desktops. The, we, we made a conscious decision a couple of years ago when COVID hit uh, to instead of dipping through laptops because that creates a, a portable workforce. They seem, uh, they seem to be working pretty well. I had probably one of the first ones and I'm still on the same one. Um, they're pretty beefed up. Oh, good. And 12, uh, 12,000 is enough at this point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, how many, how many is that, uh, equate to? So this year I was able to get nine. Okay. Nine. And that's including, um, with monitors too. Okay. You know, external monitors. Gotcha. And anticipated life cycle for the uh, laptops. I so don't this know is because it's this new. Is government. We use them to it's, like fall it's apart. new. I don't know. I'm hoping five years. 
and we cycle them out. Yes. So yes. A, a heavy user will get a new one, and that machine would maybe go to somebody else. You know? And there's some so. tweaking that can be involved as far as memory and hard drives. And they're um, what's called solid state drives now, like your phone, so they're quicker. It's not a mechanical drive in there. Good. Good. So it should last longer. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Office 365. Yeah, that's the big. a couple of years out. Yeah. I've been tossing this around for like in my head for a couple of years on why I do and I don't want to switch. Um, but after this um, cybersecurity ransomware thing we were on yeah. is <clears throat> really making me think more about it because we don't patch here. So we have an on-premise mail server. We don't patch quick enough here as Microsoft keeps coming out with, with stuff because then we got to take down the mail server. So you know we got to come in on the weekend or do it at night and then you're not going to have mail for a couple of hours. Somebody gets on there. Um, whereas Microsoft's patching 24 yep. seven. So what's included in that is you're getting probably SharePoint in there. Microsoft Teams is included in there. I know we use Zoom, but maybe that could go away and we just use Teams. Microsoft Teams. Uh, yeah, this can all be configured to use Teams or we keep both. There's a possibility Zix can go away because now it's all archived. That's, that's right. The downside would be, this is where, would be storage space. Right now, I have email from 1999 in my mailbox. Red or <laughs> I, I right click and I select. He reads every one. I right click, I select, I select all is red and so I don't get that mark. <laughs> um, we may have, there's some power, you, like uh, Mitch, is he even in here? Is he, Mitch and his 25,000 contacts. I'm like, who has that many contacts? I don't know. <laughs> but his, mine is high, his is high. I'm talking about storage. Like, I'm still under a gigabyte. I think the plan that I put in here is allowing for a gigabyte of storage space per user which is high. So we, we when we migrate over, I don't think I'm going to have to uh, like cut any email out. Um, I know the re I know we're, we're the retention the state says well, not only like 5 or 6 years. So I can go in there and say look, we're going to get rid of we're only keeping 5 years. But if I did that, you know how many people are going oh, no, <laughs> so, I still go back to Sheila's stuff. Is, <laughs> but we are archived with six. Right. But, there, but not that far back, though. Right, but there are other ways to limit um, yes. storage, right? Uh, the, the most common one is 45 instances of the same spreadsheet. Uh, right. Okay. Well, the way, I don't know if everyone knows this, but right. the way email works for, like, you send a spreadsheet to someone... It's really only one. There's a uh, what's called a dynamic link to that spreadsheet. It's not really going to each person separately, which is good. Um, storage on the yeah. back end is yeah. Problem. We here. I can keep going on premise. Uh, I have a lot of storage here, but it's the we're ransomware really looking at it for part. Security. I'll, I'll have to do some cost benefit. Analysis. Yeah, it's the we're it's really definitely the ransomware purposes. I'm worried about. Yeah. And um, Microsoft includes their spam filtering, their, their, all that stuff is built in. It's gotten a lot better. Got it. And the end user does not hear, the end user does not see a difference because they're just using their Outlook still. Got it. So uh, the, the impact to you and uh, Jeremy, uh, you still need to manage and configure it, but you're just yes. doing it in the cloud. Correct. As opposed to on site. A lot easier to. Uh, and then, you know, Microsoft being the you know, champion of killing you with uh, subscription uh, yeah. fees. That's what you're paying for, yeah, each, uh, each year. The initial cost here, I would go down. 
That's um, for help uh, migrating it over. Okay. We have to do like a redundancy thing. Yeah. And I think uh, the closer we get to making that decision, the more I want to talk about the security component. I know Charles has long been concerned about the, uh, what's going on. I think since his experience in the banking world, um, and you know, uh, we are a potential, uh, potential uh, threat uh, or potential opportunity for uh, hackers. But uh, CCM discussed that. Yeah, uh, CCM has, uh, they do, a, uh, there's a, a, a security meeting group, uh, the IT meeting group talks about Wasn't that. Wasn't there a town that got hit with it? The uh, there's a lot of them. Oh, there's been a few. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even, I don't even want to jinx myself. But, <laughs> there's yeah. been a few. If you have Sometimes good, they're very simple things, but, you know, they mess you up. There really is backups. If you, there's now ones that will encrypt your backups too. So... That's why I separate every department, like finance, all their shared documents, only they could get them. So if they got ransomware, only their files would, would get be, affected. Be no one only else. Their <laughs> only files. Only files. Well, there's a lot of them. You know, Town Hall South's files wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't get no, corrected. I know. Yeah. And, and then we would restore yeah. from a backup. Right, but they're they're going in and they're encrypting your backup before they even hit you, because oh, then you say, "Well, I got my backup," and voila, uh, you know. So. Some sixteen-year-old doing that, probably. <laughs> Good. All right. Any further right. questions? Thank you, Tony. All right. All right, Janice and engineering. Get up. Next contestant. Turn down. Price is right. <laughs> Hey. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. How are you? Good. How about you? Good. All right. All right. So, looking at um, 2024 capital, um, we have um, included the sidewalk expansion for Route 1. Uh, we have kind of had this in the budget for a while, pushing it out. But now, I think now that we have the safe streets planned, you know, finalized, and uh, we have some opportunities of where this uh, really could happen and make some good connections. Uh, so I've um, taken a look at expansion to the west as well as to the east uh, from the town center, you know, area where we already have sidewalks. Um, and Is so it's filling in little gaps where it where there's a sidewalk. And there isn't a sidewalk. Yeah, there's there's that opportunity as well. Uh, it's to fill in gaps along the Route 1 corridor, mm -hmm. and then also to do some expansion beyond the limits that are currently out there. Um, and then uh, the second sidewalk is our annual $50,000 uh, that we've been carrying for a number of years. And I utilize that every year to do our repairs uh, to, you know, tripping hazards and upgrading our um, handicap ramps as needed if they're not if they're deficient and there's uh, paving going to happen or we just need to do something to make them better. Um, so this is our uh, usual annual allotment of the 50,000 in addition to that expansion for Route 1 only sidewalks. And then the next item is uh, the Lake Quantapog Dam project. Um, we've gotten underway with the design on that project. Um, they've done the uh, hydraulic and hydrologic analysis and um, it's looking to be more of a culvert project than a dam project because there's limited things we could really do with the dam. Um, so we're going to take a look at certainly making sure the dam is in good shape going forward, um, but it's probably not going to change too much. Um, it might be more of a, a, a repair as opposed to a full replacement. Um, and uh, the real backup seems to be the, the outfall with the culverts. Um, and so looking at, that was always part of the project anyhow, is to replace those downstream culverts. And now we have opportunities with the purchase of the property um, on, on Route 77 of consolidating the roads. And then that brings into play even more culvert work because there's culverts that go under that property. So it'll, it'll give us some opportunities, I think, to better manage the water from, from the dam outfall during um, the higher storm events uh, to get that water not backing up. So the, so does that bring the price down or up or stays the same? Uh, I spoke with our engineers and they said to just hold with this number right now. Uh, we're, we're not in a 
even a concept design yeah, yet to really give you good do budget numbers, but they felt culverts, this was a good number. Underneath the new property, do they run to the river and lake or from the river and lake? Um, so the culvert that goes under the property we purchase actually pick up water runoff from the hillside and uh, Route 77, and it goes under, this is it Lake Drive or that's Lake Drive, uh, and discharges adjacent to the discharge under um, the culverts from the discharge of the dam. So it, it, it discharges so it directly to the river. The street yes, the yeah. If you, if you look at 77, that's, that's a huge hillside up oh, there. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of runoff that comes from that hillside as well as the roadway. Um, and it gets consolidated and brought across Route 77. And then it's an open ditch for a short bit and then it goes back into culverts. Now, those culverts also act to take the overflow water from the dam, because as you know, the dam overflows in like a two to five year storm event, which is pretty frequent. And then it picks up that overflow water that washes over the road currently, and then picks it up and puts it in the culverts and discharges it to the river. It's the water from across the street, the hillside or whatever, picked up in, in storm water drains, or is it if you that look at open culvert? Um, there's a number of like intermittent streams. If you look at the topography coming off yeah. that hillside, it consolidates into some intermittent streams, especially with heavy rain, you'll see it gushing off this hillside. Um, but, and it gets brought to the drainage system in this, in the state highway. And then a lot of that gets consolidated into that one area that goes into the, you know, into those culverts that eventually make its way to the river. Does the regional water authority have a reservoir up there or is that Connecticut water authority? That's regional water, water, but it's a little reach. south of there. A little south, yeah. 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 And then the next item is our um, annual road improvement um, fund. We've been uh, using up, we're currently using up some old um, bonded money that was uh, available. We just did the Briarwood um, reclaim and paving and other road um, pavement pro program. And we want to continue moving forward with um, having some road improvement plan for repaving roads. Um, as as the, um, Dave said, you know, really kind of targeting um, the use of chip sealing to where it makes is more appropriate. Some of some of our roads have never been really repaved. They've only seen chip seals, and then you see over time they start to delaminate, and uh, really kind of a, a good a good opportunity to really do either mill and paves or just overlays um, and then have a better road in the, in the long run that will last a lot longer. Uh, so uh, trying to continue to kind of fund this on an annual basis. I know you have the Hubbard Road uh, plan out for, for not this coming year, but the following. Is that to potentially extend the possible sidewalk from the new development to the up to Long Hill Road? Um, or 77 or both. Um, yes, it is oh. It is to make that connection. I thought, maybe I'm misinformed. I thought there was going to be a sidewalk from the new development to 77. No, there's only going to be a develop a sidewalk at the development. Oh, literally in front of whatever their footage Limitedly is. Limitedly in front of that new development um, to connect to where our uh, anticipated location for uh, and I call it a pedestrian improvements because I'm not sure if it'll entirely be a sidewalk or what it will end up being, but um, is, is really on the north side of the road is where it makes the most sense to have oh, okay. something right. there. So, um, yeah, that's to be looked at um, a little further. As you know, we just extended the sidewalks up 77 to 100, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's the safest location now for any uh, connection from the north to the town. Side of so there'll be two crosswalks, one down by the bridge, and then one up by 77? There's currently one at 77 now yeah, with the project. Is, there is one so we created that uh, crosswalk at, at the Hubbard Road intersection as part of the 77 project with the understanding that the sidewalk will be extended uh, down Hubbard on the north side of the road. And then yes, there'll be likely a, a mid-block crosswalk further down, probably past the bridge this development moves forward and we make this connection. Well, then the reason we chose the north side was because there's already a sidewalk that goes across the, uh, on the, the west river on the bridge. So it's the bridge the has only a sidewalk on the north side. Sorry. And looking at the available land and topography, the north side has the 
the fewest challenges for putting in a sidewalk and other locations as well. Our agreement built in the vent and everything. The logic was the north side. Remember that yeah. discussion? Because yeah. at that point in time, it looked like the development would have been on the north side. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question. Um, if Dave was talking about the crack ceiling, like you're in, you're in favor of oh, utilizing that technique. Yes, yeah. There's an opportunity to really preserve the roads for a much longer time period when you have those. A lot of times, if your center seam opens up, we have that situation on Long Hill Road in some sections, or you have some isolated cracks as well in the in the, in the road bed itself. And these are an opportunity to really preserve the road. And if, and if we're cutting back on chip ceiling, then. Yeah, it's a good way to transition. My, my staff is going to be very happy that uh, there's those calls coming. <laughs> like yeah, I mean, Dave and I are still in discussions about, you know, using chip ceiling, but, you know, I think, you know, cul-de-sac roads, those types of neighborhoods really, it doesn't make sense to use chip ceiling. It doesn't hold up well with the types of turns you get in cul-de-sacs, and it's just like kind of a messy application for those types of neighborhoods. Some of your through roads, like, you know, a recent chip seal of West Lake was more of a, it's really a pavement preservation type of application. So we had paved West Lake what, about six or seven years ago. And so now is a good time to do a chip seal to kind of preserve that asphalt before it deteriorates much further, as opposed to using it as a road improvement. It's not really a road improvement tool. It's more of a pavement preservation tool. Great. This is completely off the subject, but is that little um, problem with the road uh, near one of the lakes? Yeah, that drainage. just got paved. <laughs> yeah, it was our, uh, it, it took a while. Um, still kind of came in and had to leave, and then they came back in, and I think they paid it last week. So, yeah, that's, that's been almost finalized. We have some curbing to put out there. And um, I believe Briarwood was uh, finished up. Everything has been finished up with the paving, and then there's some curbing and handwork stuff that needs to be done to finish up the projects entirely. Uh, the transfer station was also paved, so it looks really nice. It's really cleaned up. Yeah. I think we used a little more asphalt, so we'll see where the where the bill comes in. But it was um, once we started cleaning up the place, we realized yeah, we realized there was a lot more areas that needed paving because it was hard to even know what was paved and what wasn't. So, but it really cleaned up nice. Well, we we'll just charge Madison more. <laughs> I hope they pay their fare. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, bullet drive. Yes. Um, yeah. That's been, that's been on the plan. That's been in the the plan for. Yeah. Since so the school decade. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, and it was funny. I. Not to let the cat out of the bag, but you know, talking. There's, you know, I guess now new new looks at another middle school maybe in the future. But we're using that general layout. We've looked at the gone out, gone out and looked at the property we own on 77. So it, you know, it's an opportunity here to really make some improvements for um, uh, circulation and access uh, for everyone. It's not, not only you know police, fire, and and school buses, but for everybody because there's a really long. Uh, gap in east west connections uh, between 77 sure. and Long Hill Road. Even two if, um, if and when the public works gets moved up there. Yeah, be yeah it'll be a, an, a helpful you know yeah. way of getting around yeah. and making you know shorter trips to things. So, yeah. um, and you know, we had some potential opportunities for grants Great and plans. things like that. So, we uh, you know really see this as a hopefully a project that can move forward in the in the near future. Uh, I think it'll be a great asset to the town. And then, um, and then the Twin Bridge Road replacement, um, we jumped on that recent opportunity. Um, you know, as you know, all the infrastructure money is really coming in now and DOT is ripe with money as well. And so uh, the local bridge program, um, if you recall in the past, we were responsible for, for getting a consultant or getting the design done, getting the consultant on board. And it was an 80-20. Uh, split. split usually um, going forward they're changing the program where DOT will actually manage the design process including the town's you know input um, but they'll manage it all um, and they'll pay for it all <laughs> so I'm like okay so this was That's our, hard. Five copies. <laughs> looking at the um, uh, uh, bridge uh, inspection reports this one uh, rose to the top as 
as the most likely to be eligible for funding, which is Twin Bridge Road. I did reach out to Madison since it's really like right on the town line to make them aware of the project. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's a good opportunity that, you know, we could see some savings and get some benefits. Out so of where is that off North Madison Road? Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's very few residents on that road. Um, there's a, a handful of residents in Guilford. Then you cross the bridge, and then I believe it's um, either town or land trust land. It's the, part of the Timberland Trails, I believe, is up there. Yeah, and then and then there's a few more uh, residents to the north in Madison, but not not a whole lot. And then there's a detour looking at a you know, preliminary area that makes sense actually into Madison. So that's where a lot of the cooperation would come into play, come, come into play as well. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thanks. Next up, planning and zoning. Okay. Good morning, team. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Good morning, there on Zoom. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time uh, this morning. Thank you to Mary Jane for your guidance on my first go as the uh, capital planning process here. Um, you know, I, I'll just start by saying that uh, when we first moved to Guilford, I was very impressed with the legacy of planning uh, and the, in the attention that the community has paid to land use and planning. Uh, and it's something that, you know, I sort of place as a priority to continue. Uh, so over the next five years, uh, you'll see a significant request for planning studies. Um, you know, I think that uh, we are at a time uh, here in Guilford where a lot of our major plans are dated. They're 15 years old, 20 years old. Our economic development plan is approaching 22 years old. You know, uh, and so we've done a, um, a good job at uh, trying to utilize those plans. But I think we're at a moment in time uh, where we need to reinvest in some significant plan in the town. So I envision that doing this correctly, uh, you know, you wouldn't see me coming before you again for another, you know, 10 to 15 years. So <laughs> uh, let's start with... You are the town planner. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's, I think, I think let's start with the plan of conservation and development. So this is required, uh, you know, by, by state statute uh, that we do this every 10 years. Uh, the last one was completed in 2015. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, and you'll notice that my budget is fairly front loaded. Uh, I think that time is of the essence. I feel like we should have done some of these studies yesterday, but we're gonna do our best to try to get them done in the next couple of years. Uh, and I'll also say that, you know, the planning and zoning department is small but mighty. Uh, there's three of us. So a lot of this money is to engage uh, expertise uh, in the consultancy uh, field. Uh, and so I have made a few phone calls and had discussions to try to check some of these numbers and ensure that what we're putting forward is, is realistic. Um, I think with the plan of conservation and development, we have essentially been updating uh, the plan from 1978. I'd like to break the mold. I'd like to start fresh. I'd like to try something new and a little bit more dynamic. Um, you know, when I first applied for the job, um, there was uh, a discussion of my past kind of, um, you know, practice, professional practice and sustainability. And how can we really uh, capitalize on the great efforts in town with the um, Sustainable CT and Sustainable Guilford Task Force and try to bring that to the next level. So I really envision the plan of conservation and development as the opportunity to, uh, in the process of creating that plan, engage each and every one of our 23 committees, task forces, you know, commissions uh, in setting up their own sort of priorities, goals, and objectives, which are in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it's kind of a way to make the plan of conservation and development more dynamic because now we're embedding it in commissions, communities, and or commissions, committees, and task forces that meet, you know, monthly or quarterly. So, you know, they're kind of driving this. And it would be great if we could embed um, some data collection in that process as well. So every two years, we're reporting on metrics. Uh, and then at the end of the 10-year cycle of the plan of conservation and development, we've got something. Uh, so the model uh, that I'm thinking about um, is from the city of Bridgeport. 
Uh, they did something similar, but they didn't quite have the technology to do kind of the what I refer to as a community dashboard, which would be a public sort of um, uh, interactive but web-based platform in which we actually show and report on the metrics uh, that we've listed uh, in the plan of conservation and development. So that um, you know is is kind of firmly anchors my initial request here for the ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. Um, I think this will become, you know, I guess, transition into more of an operating budget item, but it will be a, a new um, sort of resource and technology for the town. And it's really the ArcGIS Online platform that would allow us to do this community dashboard uh, that makes the plan of conservation and development uh, dynamic. So those two are, are coupled uh, with each other. So this is a software program, and is this licensing fees? Yes. Correct. Correct. Uh, and in building uh, my new team uh, at the planning and zoning department, uh, we've hired a, a young assistant town planner who has a skill set in uh, this software. So hopefully we'll have the capacity uh, to utilize it uh, during this, what I envision as a two-year process might even you know, span to three to get the plan of conservation development created and uh, be in the implementation. Hmm. Okay, uh, so moving on, you'll see these, uh, and, then, and then these other uh, studies that we're putting forward here, we're proposing are really uh, both anchored in the, you know, the commitment to continue our uh, legacy of planning, but also to position the town to get uh, some significant federal funds. So the Connecticut Community Challenges Grant, which comes out in the spring, you know, offers multi-million dollar grants uh, to do development projects, you know, but they need to be uh, based in a planning process. Um, and so we're, last, this spring, I was a little, uh, you know, uh, disappointed that we couldn't put something forward because we didn't really have a, a, enough planning and design studies to say, here's the work that we want to get done and then to receive those federal funds. So um, the historic district planning studies, the Route 1 commercial corridor master plan, uh, as well as what I'm referring to here as the town center south revamp, these are all sort of positioned, uh, or the idea is to position our town to get more federal funds uh, to build uh, significant projects, significant development projects. So um, I, I did, uh, provide you with perhaps some too flowery, flowery language there on the, the grants and the ideas here, but uh, the historic district planning studies uh, came out of a couple of uh, recent events with uh, town-owned facilities in the historic district uh, and beginning to think about, uh, I would like to continue the good work of the Guilford Facilities Task Force uh, that created some preliminary findings in April of 2020 uh, on town-owned facilities, you know, what we're using them for, what their spaces, their conditions are. So really um, engaging our historic district commission or otherwise known as our certified local government in looking at these town-owned facilities uh, throughout the historic district and using them as uh, kind of a priority stakeholder in planning uh, for not just those facilities, but also, I mean, it's actually two studies. One is for, um, a redevelopment feasibility study for the is it 78 Boston Street? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the old commonly known as the old public works. Yeah, old public works. I've also heard so the trolley, the trolley works. building. Yeah. The mm -hmm. preservation community refers to it as the trolley building. Um, so really thinking about the future use of that structure. And although it's not within the historic district, it is a historically significant structure. And so uh, it does um catch the eye of our preservation community uh, and thinking about future uses of that building and how uh, they could both, it could both benefit and potentially burden our town center. So, so sort of a study to think about the redevelopment feasibility and what we could potentially see there. Uh, the other study is one which uh, I would very much like to investigate uh, what we refer to as critical pathways of circulation within our town center. Uh, and this has a lot to do with universal design and accessibility uh, in historic structures and historic town centers. It's uh, oftentimes we see the one step up to all of our businesses, uh, and that really kind of limits uh, the ability for uh, all abled persons uh, 
uh, to uh, participate and engage, whether it be going to a public facility or a business or areas of the green. You know, and so really using this planning study in partnership with uh, the Historic District Commission to think about how do you maintain sort of the character, the architectural integrity of our historic fabric, but also ensure uh, universal design and access to our, our vibrant town center. So those are Do you happen to know what the town center itself, Glenn, I'm trying to remember when that came out. Was that in the 80s or the 90s? 2007. 2007. Yep. Uh, but so, you did step, I, I mean, even though that seems not that long ago, it seems like there's been a lot going on yeah. in that area. So I think it's great if we look at that again. Yeah. So, yeah, to segue to that study, I mean, that one will be now. There have been some significant uh, advancements in the, in the transition of the public works facility. Um, you know, it is, it would be considered transit-oriented developments. There's a lot of, you know, potential funding there. Um, you know, the original Town Center South Plan uh, utilized overlay districts and zoning to be able to kind of uh, facilitate a type of development that we would want to see there. And I think we can revisit that um, with a, a very firm eye on the what we would like to see uh, at the now public works facility. Uh, and I would also like that to be, uh, you know, again, uh, in line with making connections between the town centers of the green uh, and the marina and sort of our, you know, jewel of public access to the waterfront, which is Jacob's Beach, and thinking about all of that kind of comprehensively. Um, and so uh, that's something that uh, we would probably want to get started on sooner rather than later. Uh, lastly, the uh, Route 1 commercial corridor master plan. So um, this is really end to end, you know, from, from the border with Madison to the border with Brantford. And really beginning to think about this as both, um, you know, continuing the great work of the uh, Safe Streets Task Force that they've thought about with uh, pedestrian and cyclist planning, but so it'll have an element of transportation planning, but it will also have an element of uh, economic development planning. Uh, Route 1 is our commercial corridor. Uh, it is also the area that has been identified for our affordable housing developments. Uh, it has uh, access to consistent bus transportation. It has public water. Uh, it's not within the floodplain, uh, unlike our train station. So a little bit of a different take on transit-oriented development. And, and the idea for this study really came out of, uh, as you know, the town has been engaging in a comprehensive rewrite of our zoning regulations. Uh, as we've been going through this process of trying to receive feedback from various commissions, committees, and task forces, uh, I have found that the Economic Development Commission uh, and the Housing Committee and the Planning and Zoning Commission are looking for an opportunity to begin to think about kind of the, the placemaking and the rhythm, if you will, uh, and the feel of Route 1. You know, like if you go from U-Haul out to the uh, you know, to the rotary, to the traffic circle, you'll see that there is a little bit of a pattern. I mean, once we reach town center, you know, where the road becomes a little bit more narrow, we have sidewalks, but what if we thought about lighting? What if we thought about streetscape? What if we thought about comprehensive signage? And then as you kind of go further out from the town center, I think there's opportunities there for more mixed use development. And so we really need an, the ability to take what is now kind of just a, an organizational look at our 22 commercial business and industrial districts and a consolidation of them. That's what's happening in the current zoning regulations rewrite. But we need that extra sort of refinement that says, here we want to focus on, you know, um, pedestrian oriented, higher density development, you know, out in the other parts of Route 1, we may want to focus on mixed use commercial development because, you know, I've been hearing from business owner owners that commercial space along Route 1 next to town center uh, is, you know, it's hard for them to keep tenants because it's becoming expensive uh, relatively to the further uh, outer parts of Route 1. So there's a there's sort of a desire and a need to do some comprehensive uh, study and thinking about Route One as a whole. And that's where uh, that proposal is coming. 
Uh, developers and property owners are complaining, not complaining, commenting that it's difficult to keep tenants because of the cost of rental space. Correct. Some of them believe that the best and highest use of their now commercial space, which is close to town center, would be housing. So the you know the the beauty of zoning regulations is that they can help you implement a plan. Where we find ourselves now is comprehensively overhauling our zoning regulations, perhaps in the absence of a plan. <laughs> so, you know, I don't. I'm, we're not interested in slowing. You know, the great work that has already happened with getting our you know new zoning regulations almost to the finish line. Uh, but you know, we are very mindful that particularly around along Route One and within our commercial and business districts. We don't have an overall plan, uh, and so we're trying to keep to, a, you know, just organization, uh, better organization of those districts, consolidation of those districts, and that's been really the heart of the discussion with the public and the Planning and Zoning Commission around some of those changes. Um, it's been, you know. Interesting perspective that we don't have a plan, because my perspective from years of being both on economic development and planning and zoning what, 15 years. Um, frankly, you know, when you're talking the early 2000s, I would almost have the perspective of too many plans. And maybe that's where you're coming from now is that we had a number of plans and they were never coordinated under one. Correct. Uh, the last revision of plan of conservation and development was fairly elaborate and there was some some attempt to to bring in the discussions of the different commissions and to have people participate i think once it was written the intentions might not have happened with the evolution and that type of thing so i, I think that's very admirable to find a way to bring uh bring some of the plans together under a larger umbrella, which, you know, to your point of having so many districts and so many uh, silos or whatever you want to call them, I mean, you know, there's got to be some overview with some umbrella. Uh, the, the one thing I'm going to just throw out that I remember that I, I haven't heard you mention, and you know, obviously you put a lot of thought to this, and I, and I think it's great going forward, but there used to be quite a bit of discussion about traffic around the green, <laughs> and there always was a, a desire to find a better developing another perimeter. We built the perimeter around River Street and there and sidewalks, and I think that expanded the center. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, we never we never found an answer for the traffic pattern. I mean, granted, public works may be moving, so evolve away from all the trucks driving through twice a day. But uh, that that's the only thing I didn't hear today and that I've always thought it's not going to be easy, especially now with the, the development behind the post office there, but that would have been the ideal one to, to follow you know, River Street yeah. through and around to the bridge and then the, the property south of the railroad beyond public works, uh, but I guess that's been eliminated now, that possibility. The, um, so there's a nice the, piece of property beyond the railroad over yeah. there. But the, the development, potential development for public works uh, will exacerbate the issue right. relative to tracking uh, uh, traffic here in town. And it's not uncommon for me to get uh, advice from a lot of folks as to how to take care of the traffic problem, um, <laughs> including, uh, you know, we should make it one way all the way around. Right, then. Right. Intersection of Water Street. Yeah, yeah. and well, a roundabout. Like someone advised me yesterday that a roundabout should go there. Actually, it was a, it's funny you mentioned Bridgeport. It was a former mayor of uh, Bridgeport, uh, Bill Finch, who was responsible for pulling that, I think that plan, uh, Bridgeport 20 something. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he actually referenced that yesterday and told me to go take a look at it. So, uh, I absolutely, it's interesting. They should be proud of it. Yep, it's, yeah, it's interesting that. Uh, that you uh, identified that as a model. Most folks probably wouldn't consider Bridgeport to be the model in terms of 
much of anything relative <laughs> well, to city planning. Now, that, no, no, they're that, waterfront Phil said that himself. is a big said, deal. They're waterfront right. I mean, if right. they ever let exactly it happen. Um, Just changing the crosswalks at um, uh, Whitfield and Water in Boston helped a lot. Yeah. So too. It, it did. I still see knuckleheads. People haven't going figured diagonally out their across, right. across, yeah, the Diagonally across. Diagonally across. I saw that. I said, an elderly woman go diagonally across that intersection and go, what? Yeah. That, you know, well, I do. I mean, I do think to, to bring bring back here. I do think that the town center self revamp was all about creating those connections between or the original plan between the green uh, and, and the water. marina. And so, with you know development of long public works in mind, I think that we can begin to talk about not just pedestrian traffic but car traffic. Yep. Um, but I also know that when I mentioned uh, the historic district planning studies to the Safe Streets Task Force. They were very interested in talking about traffic patterns in and around the group. So I don't yeah, know. Expanding the perimeter by the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, neighborhoods are entrenched at this point. They are built. Okay. Any other uh, questions for them? Oh, any any questions for Jane before I make uh, some comments? You're good. 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 Um, it's this time of year when uh, the audit gets close to being finished, uh, and we are anticipating a pretty significant surplus. Um, so these studies uh, were ones that I thought might be most appropriate to reserve um, because this is a, these are long term investments in the community, um, and the, the number is uh, approaching maybe $2 million in terms of. Uh, 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 surplus this year. Um, again, not to let the cat out of the bag, but uh, we're going to be bringing forward some recommendations about um, our undesignated fund balance policy, our fund policies, uh, and so there, there hopefully there'll be some changes there. But this is for our brethren on the board of uh, finance. Um, we will probably be unveiling a, a plan to utilize some of those. Not probably, we will be unveiling a plan to utilize uh, some of those surplus funds. To set aside uh, designated uh, designated funds for projects like this. So, Does that mean it's a little key? bit careful with building sheets because you know a lot of you have to be careful that they're not one time situations. With the, with the surplus, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm not committing yeah. to operating budgets. We're talking about okay. committing to so, capital right. projects. Uh, which are one time events. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, no pressure coming out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if I wasn't clear, I apologize. As much as, you know, a lot of the funds that are out there serve the very significant <laughs> necessary purpose of uh, keeping us functioning. Uh, but yeah, I got these last year. Do these you mean that it, it, it's possible with the plan that you're going to talk about in the future, or near future, that? Some of these studies could start before July um, of twenty three. So we need to have this for discussion this week because it'll be on our agendas for Monday because right. our audit is coming to a completion. Um, but so if we if we move that money, it will be as of June 30, 2022. Um, that money would be immediately available. Um, obviously, has to come through all the. Mm -hmm. you know right yes. you know purchasing and you, yes. you know what i mean um but that money would be immediately um available and um uh, i i think matt and i have both had discussions with jamie um about this uh probability i'll say um of moving some of this um this money so jamie's uh, you know aware that that this might come to fruition and if at such she would be able to from my conversations with Jamie, we're not we're not putting five plans in place starting next month, right. but it will allow it would allow her to Start plan um, the, the plan, yeah, plan the um, you know how, how she could do that. She would yeah. not have to wait until right. July one of, mm -hmm. of 2023. She, um, the money would be available immediately. And Probably said more than you needed to know, but that <laughs> in, in, in looking at capital budgets, my experience as a department head and then on the five years on this board. This is a uh, ambitious um, amount of money for this particular department, but we have not seen requests from this particular department okay. to this um, amount for at least that I can think of, at least in the last five years. So even though it seems like, wow, you know, 
but it's not really wow. It's things that probably should have been done before or should be ongoing. So it's funny perspectives. I think it all was just yesterday. <laughs> and I was wondering about um, the the, the uh, software thing, whether that could somehow start sooner since it's $3,500. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think that's in cooperation with another yeah. plan, right? right. So, um, so whenever the plans start, yeah, certainly for that we could start it tomorrow if we had to. Yeah. We have, yeah. you know. Um, so yes, Sandy, we could certainly start that, um, and 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 remove that from here as well. Um, put it in the operating budget, yeah. which would be the recommendation, yeah. and have that available at at the appropriate time um, when it is. And I think because of the, you know, not everybody's aware of this major zoning rewrite, but that's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. And um, some of these things really um, complement it so well. And I, I think the, I don't, I don't know the mood of the town, but I don't know. These all seem very positive. That's what I'm going to say. How is the conversion of uh, all of the the zoning maps and records and that type of thing going is that uh that's a that's a coordinated effort with new england geosystems who is currently the entity that does that type of mapping for us uh we did uh luckily back in january of this year we had uh the new maps the proposed maps because you know yeah you're right if you look at the existing commercial and business districts it's you know a little you know, I don't even know, Jackson Pollock painting, you know, different, <laughs> different uh, colors along Route 1. Uh, and so they've already worked on the consolidation of those uh, districts, which is hopefully what will get voted uh, into effect in March of, of next year. Um, so that I, I feel good that that uh, process has already uh, been started with New England Geosystems. So it's basically once we uh, get the new regs approved, we could kind of flip the switch and have the new zoning map. It's not that simple, but it's, it's <laughs> starting. So getting all those maps and everything digitized has been progressing okay? Because I know we made the commitment, I don't know if it was last budget cycle or the one before. Yeah, I think there might be an extra maybe $2,000 that New England Geosystems needs to complete that work. That's a big deal too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that, that is that a big deal. Do. So you can imagine when the commission said, well, maybe we won't consolidate. And I said, no, no, we're good. <laughs> this is I remember the first computer, Jerry Silver, when he first started, you know, the GIS system over there, was an economic development computer. That was our budget. But uh, the maps didn't fit. <laughs> The, the plots didn't fit, so they used to just draw lines. It said that some days, you know, when each one gets recorded for a sale, they'll get, they'll get you know, exact. But they were just, I couldn't believe it. Was that much. So I, they talk about jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. I have a question about the studies, Jenny. Yes. If we do end up going down this ambitious and forward looking <laughs> route, um, with so many things happening at the same time, and you mentioned having a staff degree, right? Is there any what, what would happen if you brought on more staff and reduced the consultant aspect of it? Does that make it work better? Is it better for the, the town? And, and uh... Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. That I, um, you know, perhaps at times I've thought about what my dream team would be, and it involves another staff member for sure. Um, I think that there is enough kind of uh, rendering and visioning uh, and uh, spatial analysis and mapping to have kind of a full-time sort of graphic oriented person um, as well as uh, one who can do GIS and then bring on another planner. Uh, you know, and I think, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hadn't really considered that. Um, I. I I do enjoy working with consultants. You know, I enjoy, um, you know, getting as much as I can out of a meager budget. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, which is different. I mean, I've, I've always worked in towns that were under-resourced. Uh, we were in a different spot here. So, um, you know, I think that I have a lot of confidence in the ability to get a lot out of a consultancy team. Mm -hmm. um, but, 
Yeah, I, really I think the value of consultant survival experience in the past is you can't lock yourself into one or a group of consultants. You get the value of consultants mm -hmm. is you diversity. get diversity and perspective sure. from different communities, mm -hmm. even out of state ones. I always found it was interesting that uh, other states, especially states on the shore or towns on the shore, uh, it's some interesting sure. ideas out there. But off, often they're priced in such a way that the more Pricing you is take on yourself, no, you question. still have no, that expertise, yeah, I, but I you know, you're paying them for what they're really good at, not for what you can do, yeah. do yourself. So. And then there's so I always think too, there's so much knowledge that they get. They gather all this information. Sure. They learn so much and, and they, then they move on and apply it in the next yeah. day. <laughs> and do they really convey all that back to you and yeah. staff? So. I mean, I think I, I do feel like Guilford has such an engaged populace that we could really almost do some um, skill building uh, amongst our committees, commissions, and task forces to kind of empower them. And I think maybe some of the software and, and these plans and the approach to the POC might help in that matter, um, you know, to, to make the office even bigger in that sense. It is. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Jim. Thank Any, you. Anybody from the Board of uh, Finance? Comments or questions? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item 10. Building. Kim, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. We can. Okay. Hello, Matt, the selectmen and selector, uh, Board of Selectors. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm here for my capital budgets just to ask for a second vehicle for the building department. I am grateful for the truck that I was approved and it's working well, but we are still short down one vehicle. Uh, if there's a, if the truck is in use and if there's an emergency with fire police, we don't have another vehicle for us to use to go out to see those emergencies. So I'm asking the board to be able to purchase a hybrid four wheel drive um, vehicle. And uh, who would be the predominant user of that vehicle? Most likely myself. Okay. And who's so who's using the first? Who would be using the first vehicle if you're using the second one? I use uh, the, the first vehicle is also being used by myself and the and also the um, the inspectors. the The truck is used because we have so much construction and we still have a, another probably two more hundred new constructions that's going to be coming through uh, within another year. We need the truck because these vehicles are too low and we go to do footings and foundations inspections The cars are be, um, being stuck in these places. So having a truck like this, we need to do that. We need to have it to go to those inspections and be able to get out safely without having to be uh, assisted out by others. I was more along the lines of your, your, your staff consists of yourself and uh, what, three part-time employees at this point, right? Um, yes, actually four. Four. And so they, they would utilize that truck when needed on those, those, those sites that they needed to go to. Yes. Okay. So we don't Are, have a full-time assistant building inspector. We have four part-time assistants, correct? That is correct. Yes. Are they the ones that are using their own vehicles? Some of them are using their own vehicles for, for things that don't require the, that kind of site visit work. Um, right. And yeah, I, I, well, we're, paying paying mileage, we're paying yeah. mileage for them. So just I mean, isn't mileage like 50, 60 cents? Yeah, miles? yeah, 62, I think, isn't it? Somewhere around that number. Um, so yeah, I, I sign those requisitions every month. Um, so, so Kim, you know. Apropos of comments just uh, or the questions just made, um, I think we had at, at one point talked about evaluating the efficacy of going through a full time uh, employee as opposed to the part timers that you have out there. So I think that's probably something we should be talking about over the next couple of months as we uh, prepare the operating budgets as to whether or not that makes sense. I know we've had those conversations. Uh, so uh, I'd like I think to get to the individuals are yeah their value yeah there's uh, George Godovin is absolutely invaluable uh, to us right now on the commercial side so 
but George is uh, George is one of four, right? Uh, so the other yeah. three, which yeah. you know are either you know eight or sixteen hours a piece. Um, again, I'm not saying we sh we should definitely do it. Um, you know the, the way we're doing it now gives us the ability to flex up and, and flex down. Um, so, but let's uh, let's let's make and sure we're, we're currently covering the cost of that through ARPA. Yes, because we because of the building uh, permit. That's right. Okay. Any other questions for Kim? Thanks, Kim. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We mean we're covering the cost of the employees' payroll through ARPA. Uh, we are through the operating budget. Um, this board made some decisions to um, utilize ARPA money to cover some for the additional, the two additional right, the addi um, inspectors that we brought on because of the boom during COVID. Right. In the anticipation that over the time through ARPA, we would evaluate um, whether or not they were oh, okay. still yeah, needed. Right. Um, it, instead, of, in, instead of bringing our operating expenses up um, by that, which which may just be a, a blip um, over time. So the same situation spikes. exists for you. Spikes, yeah. Services, right? Whenever we get dried around. Okay, yeah. So you can use our funds for temporary salaries. You can use, a, you can use it for any general any general government expense save for pension, pension and debt retirement. So. Okay. Okay. Sonia, sorry to uh, delay your presentation. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you, Board of Select People? Um, I'm actually going to piggyback off of Kim. The only thing that I need is um, another car, a hybrid vehicle. We do not need a four-wheel drive one, though. Um, most of my inspectors go out in the field. The truck that we got last time is, is incredible. It's great. We go on to test pits and doing final inspections. A lot of times, places haven't even been developed, and we're the first ones on site. So the truck is incredible, and I thank you guys. Uh, the other one that we're looking for is a hybrid, just regular car. We also do uh, quite a few inspections every year, pools, food service establishments, salons, daycares, the list goes on. So right now we currently have the truck, the old Crown Vic, which was a 2003, um, has been put out to pasture. It is, uh, we definitely need another vehicle for the health department. And that's my one and only capital request. Hey, the old Crown Vic is still, still. going. <laughs> <laughs> that's the yellow one, right? The white one. The crowns are white. It's white. And the request is for two years out, not for the coming year. Is that right? right. Correct. Right. Okay. But, but, it's, but, but Sonia, is that crown Vic working or not? Because you said put out to pasture. It has yeah. not been working. There was an incident a couple um, months ago. The uh, window doesn't roll up. There was a quick acceleration and back one time when my inspector was using it. Uh, we have not used it since then. We've asked Public Works to take a look at it but it is not in good shape and it's been nobody uses it at this time 2003 so so should we um move it into this coming fiscal year i would love that but i also know yeah. that it's and page one kind of two-thirds down the paper so three quarter down. Uh, uh, to me i mean Let's put it in there. Let's yeah. put it in there for the next set of discussions, and then we can always move it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because okay. so, we were in kind of a car desert there for a while, and we're, I think we're doing better. Catch it. She replaced the car with a hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Save it in gas mileage. Exactly. And one thing we brought up last year, kind of at the end of the process, was the possibility of sharing a vehicle and just kind of working around each other. Does that? Might that work for you? It's possible. I mean, we have no aversion to a, a used car or another car that nobody wants. Um, really, it's the inspections that are around town. I'm not so worried. The first truck was a necessity. This is just a regular car that needs to go around town. Uh, you know, we could share one with another inspector, but please note in, in our field, those two inspectors are out 75% of the time at inspections or doing septic work. Thanks. All right, anything further? No, that's Sorry, it. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Have a nice day. Have a good day. All right, town properties. Steve Hyden. Well, Steve, if you remember, because of the lack of staffing, we gave them a pass. Oh, yeah, that's right. For today. Yep. Um, so I talked to me. Uh, 
So, you know, he has on there um, some items that um, we've seen last year, um, looking to redo the town hall south roof um, this upcoming year. Um, also looking to refurbish the lights on the town green, which would not only um, put new lights, um, but would add a electric outlets. I believe we talked about that last year where um, we they've had some need for that um, during events. Um, and uh, again, from last year, he's looking to replace his 1999 van that he, he drives um, uh, with, with a new vehicle. Um, so that's what he's looking for, for okay. this year. Um, talking about the refurbishing the lights on the town green, I mean, Charles, we all might remember the disaster we had mm -hmm. with uh, the design and the removal of the lights. Is, we're utilizing the same structures or? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I, okay. I didn't well, get we'll a lot of it. We well, can we'll talk, talk to him about, about that. Yep. I, would, I just would add a comment to that. A, a number of people, and I notice it myself because I drive downtown at night often. Um, I don't care if the light fixtures are replaced, but I think that the illumination is could be better. I know, I know you still want it down and all that, but I just think it could be brighter down because people are walking on there in the dark and it's not that many but there is sometimes and especially this time of year it's dark by five it, it's not no. yeah it's not like it's unsafe but it, it just could be brighter that's all and and it would brighten up the town a little bit i'm, I'm not saying for you know you get what i'm saying yes i yeah. can certainly ask him yeah. Yeah. Some additional yeah. information on that yeah, it'd be interesting to know what the refurbishment is. I mean, if they're going to LEDs or something like that, are they talking about putting outlets on the pole? And yeah, so that each pole that. would have outlets so they can utilize them during events. Yeah, then that means people can plug, plug in, phones and, in and yeah. charge whatever they want all, all day long. So turning sure. it. And what? Sounds good. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to think that one through. Because I yeah. bet you, number one, it's major rewiring. Right. To, to run a wire to a, a light bulb is a lot different than putting a couple of wires in his house. Plus, we'll get more information. Yeah, we'll get more yeah, yeah, and having them available to anybody and everybody who died, mm -hmm. and you don't know about that. Yeah, that, um, any change to those, the structure of those things probably has got to go through the Green Committee, too, mm -hmm. at, least a, at least a discussion. Um, I to go through the House and Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we have some questions for Steve that we'll follow up on. Yep. All right. Uh, I'd I, like to bring up, since we, if you have a couple minutes, absolutely. I'd like to bring up one item. Karen, can you come on the screen? She's on a telephone call. She's oh, okay. All right. Tell her I was going to talk about the inventory. Okay. So um, last year, there was a discussion regarding the vehicles and just knowing what we have and and being able to do um, to do those now. So um, Karen um, came to be about to me about a month ago and um, we started to talk about hiring a consultant to do an actual inventory. We have three things right now. We have our fixed asset inventory on Munis that I manage. We have our insurance mm -hmm. detail that Karen manages and then we have what we really have in our departments. <laughs> and we try to do a decent job of big things. Well, we know our buildings and we know pretty much most of our vehicles, although we don't always um, you know, get that information um, readily. Um, but we'd really like to establish a true baseline. Um, we have things on our fixed assets that we probably haven't had for 20 years. Um, and, and sending lists out to departments doesn't always, you know, work. Um, so uh, we actually spent the last month, uh, the whole month of October, trying to find a company to do this. And I have to tell you, we struggled. Um, sure. We went through CCM. We went through the state. I contacted every finance director. I contacted Scrog. Karen and I did Google searches. Um, <laughs> we did everything we could. Um, I had this done in Durham. That company no longer exists. Um, and just... Uh, the day of CCM, at, I was at the CCM convention, and I got an email from another community with a name. I sent it 
to Karen. Um, we had hoped to have the information um, to bring forward his capital. And we finally were in contact with him. Was it yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Um, so uh, we gave him um, what we were looking for. We're not looking for him to value anything. We, you know, values will handle ourselves. We're, we're looking, he, they can tag. Um, our Muni system has the ability to manage taggings. Um, but we really just thought, um, Karen and I work together when she's doing insurance and I share what we have on fixed assets. And we're, we're certain we're, we're ensuring, you know, what we really need to ensure, and, and that's not a problem, but we really want to establish what we really have um, and something that we can manage better um, and have our departments manage on a yearly basis or a monthly basis or when things come in. You know, we trade something in, we want to make sure it comes off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or we... Exactly. Um, so we have no idea um, what this cost is. Karen and I both spoke to the gentleman yesterday, um, told them what we were looking for, and he's going to uh, come back to us um, with an amount. So I'm hoping that you'll allow us to, to add that um, to the capital plan and we can review it. And, and I don't know if it's 10000 or 100000 I have, you know, I have no idea. Um, where, where that's coming in, um, but uh, the request comes from both Karen and I, um, both departments. Um, if we were able that, to do this, it sounds like a good idea. Then going forward, it would be managed be, by you and Karen with the department with the heads, department heads. We, doing right. a better job. Well, being able to do a better job of keeping you up that's, to date. That's the right. goal. Yeah. That's the goal. And then we would be able to know um, exactly where our vehicles are at, what the status of those vehicles are, if they're sitting on the lot, if they can be used, it, you know, if yeah. we can share um, our, we would hope our goal would be that it would be a useful tool um, moving forward. But I think we really need to know so where what would where happen those to are. The, the report like that the second month after you've had it and changes happen. But how does it get up there? We would we would manage that on our, that on our end. The, is that a munis function? Like I said, yeah. munis right now manages all of it, but it's got things on there that's been put on, you know, since two thousand and two or nine, whenever it started. You know what I mean? Um, and because uh, I think uh, I think finance used to manage it on paper, and then it was transferred, you know, into into munis, and and we've we've now transferred. Um, waste transfers, you, you know, everybody's fixed assets. Um, we've tried to make to process into into so Minnesota. You're not talking just vehicles. You're talking about every all equipment. Mm -hmm. all talking about everything. You know, um, Karen's managing um, buildings and contents, which mm -hmm. would would be that, and she's also managing vehicles through insurance. Um, right. I manage anything over five thousand dollars that has a life. <laughs> you know, but we've. I'm, I'm sure there's stuff on there that maybe is sitting in a back room that people are using for parts. Should it be on our app? Should it be, in, you know, um, but I'm really looking to, to establish a, a baseline. And, and I have to tell you, there were five other communities that were looking for the same thing. And they're, they're looking for guidance from Guilford um, at, at, at this point. Um, you know, other communities have had an intern do it, but I just can't see taking an intern, you know, a high school kid, and throwing in public works and having them determine what what's out there, what they you know, we really need somebody that you know make organize this and yeah. correct, correct, <laughs> and, and not for nothing. We just can't manage. We can't do that ourselves. We don't have the time or the the okay. resources to you know to do that. And if a company comes in, they're more apt to you know. Yeah. Okay, well, get in. So we well, we don't know what it is, but um, we, we we've been work. We tried. <laughs> we, <laughs> we did tried to get it to get it timely. Where is this company? Where's the company? From? New Jersey, New, New Jersey. Jersey. And how much did you pay for Durham? You probably don't remember. I I, I don't remember, but it it was I it couldn't have been a lot of money. No. <laughs> Plus, Durham. it's it's Durham. I didn't have a lot of things. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't have a police department or a fire department um yeah. uh, so it it's really not apples to apples at this point and that was probably 15 years ago <laughs> so um you know it, it it's different but mm -hmm. um it, 
exactly you know if, if what we can do to, to try to help that then we we would have a plan we would have a list and we could see the vehicles that we have maybe this car could be utilized and shared or you know maybe maybe not maybe the plan doesn't really help us and it's they have to work on figure it out themselves but um we'd at least know last year when you asked how many vehicles do we have couldn't give you i can tell you what numbers we have whether or not that's 100 percent accurate yeah, sure. Um, yeah. not, and, and I'm not um, trying to uh, say anything bad about any department or any Our prior own, people that worked on this. It's just, on it's just, yes. it, right. Our it just hasn't been in a focus, right? By one person? Yes. Yes. I can't believe that any, well, the question is, list. Yeah. who do you insure for us? Right. But we provide that list. That's the issue. You may you know, be insuring a vehicle that isn't being driven. Or, well, it's possible. Yeah. You know, so the, maybe, maybe we have the vehicle. Is there any other way that we're not insuring something we have? Yeah. Karen? Well, Karen, you read a comment? Well, no, I was just going to say at the end of every fiscal year, I reach out to every department and ask them, I'll send them a list of what I have. Please update it. And they do. But some departments are really crunched for time and personnel right now. And we've had changes in personnel. So people are not aware of what they need to keep track of. So I really feel strongly that we really need to have a good base because I'm not confident in the base that I have right now. We also need to provide to the state twice a year a list of all our vehicles with municipal plates on them. And I want to make sure that that is as accurate as we can get it. So um, I, th I, think, I, I think it would be a value to the town as a good base. I think we sort of need to have a solid, know that we have a solid base. Well, we could probably do just the vehicle piece internally. I mean, it sounds like the 80-20 rule. You get 80% of the value of the project mm -hmm. by you know, yeah. just the vehicles. I mean, yep. if, if, you, if you strike out getting somebody, maybe it's worth just figuring but out. But you would probably have to do that on a weekend, no? Because all your vehicles are everywhere during the day, the course of a business day. There's no one place where everything is unless you did it before everybody really early in the morning or in the evening or on a weekend. I don't, I'm not sure but it, you, the, you the can't pull the truck, like you can't pull public works yeah. off the road to just go through it and then, you know, check every VIN number and, and just want to be sure make a model. I think it sounds like it's something, I mean, this is not going to be an ongoing thing. No. It's, it's a one, mm -hmm. maybe you do it every 10 years, well, but I mean, it's not, you're going to not going to hire this, consulted every year to do this no it would just be a one-time no. thing to establish yeah. where we are and then we would establish some type of policy well, rule we'll go, you know moving yeah. forward let's see what this individual goes yeah we don't we don't know what it is like i said have we could modify the scope to handle the vehicle piece ourselves if, if need be i guess so i don't potentially change the scope. Let's try are you still on yeah we're still on sorry okay. all right yeah it's just um it's just what we're bringing forward as a as, as an option, so. And then we can and we can play with the scope. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Good. Correct. We have no, no idea what it's going to be, but like I said, we we've been working on it for a long time, trying to to get it here. Cool. All right. Um, before we adjourn, Thanks, any comments or questions uh, from? Do the... we need to go over the selectman one? Well, those are. Well, I mean, I, I just didn't know. Those are the ones that we have on there as placeholders. I, okay, I, I didn't yeah. even. Yeah. Okay. I like having this. Buller Drive, is that the item that Janice has in her section? Yeah. Yes. Oh, right, because she added it yeah. over there. Yeah. And public works site, that refers to, um, that's not the building kind of right That refers to the, the building of the site. Possibly, possibly. Is that also right. this? I thought it was somewhere else. So I'm sorry, I thought it referred to the building right around the corner here. If so, isn't that on here someplace else? Yeah, 43 Boston, right? Whatever. Which one are you looking at? Public Old Public Works. We mean the building oh. that we used have have a storage right on Graves Avenue. That's the remediation. That's if we move out of the yeah. when we move out of what is currently public works. Would it require any remediation from gas, oh, oil? So, so you're talking about the one by the railroad station? Correct. Okay. That, okay that's what I thought. All right. Remediation. All right. And I thought it was the other one. So. Yes. I think that we would take Bender Park basketball course out, right? Oh, please. Yeah.
House Church Street. Uh, that's the house oh, next to the park right? right? Yeah, that was denied by um, the Historic District Commission. So denied demolition. It was it, it, it denied the demolition and, and the use uh, without prejudice. So we've entered into some discussions with a couple of the board members um, to to see what we can accommodate uh, prior to us. Uh, we, we made a decision not to appeal it, which we had a right to do, appeal it to, uh, to the state superior court, I think it was. Uh, we decided not to do that because we had an offer to have discussions um, with the board members, certain board members. Um, by the way, it was voted down four to one. Um, so, uh, so Jamie uh, and uh, Janice are working with the board, uh, with those board members to determine what permutations of our plan could survive mm -hmm. prior to you put it on the market uh, yeah that was actually a suggestion by somebody so but uh, i'm still firmly convinced regardless of the position of the historic district that the highest and best use for our community is to increase our capacity to uh, allow for adequate parking uh, for our community center, if not for the very fact that, you know, four days a week we have between 50 and 80 seniors trying to come down for lunch and then meetings taking place and, you know, classes and, and so forth going on. Um, and to, to it, it, it adds to the configuration of parking around the green tip. Yeah, you know what I mean? It absolutely it's does. The, it's, the, see, the community center is a big need, but if you look at if yeah, you just look at cool. around the green, it was yes. it's yeah. excellent yeah. Uh, and that's addition. By yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're reserving our right to to reapply. Obviously, we can reapply uh, with either the same application or or a modified application. So uh, we need to try to uh, gauge the temperature <sighs> of the, the board as to what they will uh, what what permutations would be possible. So. Uh, and we're having uh, hopefully honest, earnest discussions about that. I thought at one time it was three, three. It's long. No, there's only five. Oh. There's uh, five seated, and then there's a couple of alternates oh. that would sit. Uh, if... So, okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Holding me to <laughs> All right. Anything from the Board of Finance? Thank you for letting thank us you very, Thank you very much for joining us today. Hopefully it was helpful. And uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, let me try your minds. All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries. He was here. Yeah, he was on there, but he, was, he, he couldn't get his camera to work. Uh,